So bismillah walhamdulillah was salatu was salam ala sayyidil mursaleen Muhammadin il Muhammadin il amin amma ba'd Rabbi shahli sadri wa yasirli amri wa ahlul uqadatan min lisani yafkahu qawli Allahumma arina al haqqa haqqa wa rizqna tiba wa arina al batila batila wa rizqna jtinaba I hope today inshallah uh, you will definitely uh, feel your understanding of the different versions of Christian eschatology will become very clear. And as a, as a result of that, what will also become clear is um, who is uh, clearly being used by shaitan and who is being true, at least trying to be true to their original. This will become very, 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 very clear. And also the link between uh, what usually is called Protestant uh, Christianity. Uh, one thing I want to share with you again, um, you know, I, I didn't uh, get a chance to get all my links up. So many times you're going to see me just typing in here and getting information as I'm talking about it, inshallah. But uh, you will see that the Christian Zionists, uh, Christian zionists uh and palestine um the first uh the christian zionists were the the first people really uh that tried to say we need to establish israel okay it was the christians uh and the christian world in england a group of them that wanted israel to be established now this is going to be a very important part of this connection because it has to do with the two different eschatologies, uh, as you will see, inshallah, let me let people in as they come in, okay, and uh, let me just write here, Christian Zionists, uh, Zionism uh, gave birth to Israel, let's see what happens, um, so you'll see this, Christian Zionism is a belief amongst Christians that the return of Jesus to the Holy Land and the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948 were in accordance to biblical prophecy, okay? The term began to be used in the mid-20th century, superseding Christian restor rest restorationalism. And uh, so when uh, the Jews asked for Israel, we're, we're talking about where to take the Jewish people, including the talk of taking them to Uganda. And many of you people know this history. It was the Christian Zionists that includes primarily who? The Protestants and the evangelicals. So just keep this in mind. They're the ones that wanted to establish the state of Israel. Now, this will become a very, very important point as we're discussing the two different uh, theologies or the two different eschatologies that exist within Christianity, okay? Um, so uh, I'm going to start off with the boring lecture first and then go to the more, or you know what? Uh, we'll, we'll mix it up a little bit. Uh, so let's go here first. This is one brother sent this to me. Let's see if I can get this started here. Uh, And then I have to do this. So we'll start off with this. Now, this is whose theology? This is the evangelical Christians. This is the Western world's Christianity, meaning the West of the West, the US and Europe. This is their view for more than a, almost 100 years now, this is their view of what the future is, okay? And so I'm gonna discuss uh, these, so we're gonna watch three videos, and this is the first of them. 
The Bible tells us there's going to be several great world empires we're going to rule in succession. One of the great chapters in the Bible, a couple of the great prophetic chapters, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, you have these four great beasts, and they, they symbolize the Babylonian Empire, then the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire. And then we know those happened in succession, exactly as Daniel said. But that fourth and final empire that represented the Roman Empire is pictured in a stage where it's ruled over by ten kings kings, 10 individuals, 10 people. And that's in place whenever Jesus returns. And we know that Rome historically has never been ruled over by 10 kings or 10 people. Mm -hmm. So since everything else... So 10 people being over uh, Rome represents, according to him, the European Union and NATO. So just keep this in mind. And that prophecy was all literally fulfilled. Well, we believe that has to be literally fulfilled as well. So that's been the basis for what a lot of theologians have called a reunited or revived Roman Empire. And so I believe the Bible speaks of a reuniting or a reviving of the Roman Empire in the end times. Under initially these 10 kings or these 10 rulers, kind of like a, a ruling oligarchy. Is there a like geographical that. area where they tend to gather? Is it, is it Europe as we think of it today? Well, of course, the old Roman Empire was in a lot of Europe. It was the western part of Asia, the northern part of Africa. We don't know what the exact nations are in this end time reuniting or revival, but it does tell us there will be some type of a revival or reuniting of the Roman Empire initially under 10 rulers. And you could see how that would happen today. A, a committee of 10 were going to come on the scene initially uh, in the end time. Well, we see lots happening right now in, 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 in the area of Russia and Ukraine. And when I was growing up, and as I continue to study the Bible, listen to Bible pro uh, professors and prophetic experts like yourself of another generation, they often talked about the army to the north. And I think Rosh was the, was the word that was used in yes. the original language of the Bible. Is that Russia? Yeah, the word Rosh there, Rosh, is used in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And we don't just say that it's Russia because the words sound alike. A lot of people say, well, you know, Rosh sounds like Russia. Uh, there really is good evidence biblically, and when you go back in the language, that this was the area that we know today as Russia. And geographically, it is to right. the north of Israel. That's right. And it says three times there in Ezekiel 38 and 39 to the uttermost parts of the north. Well, all distances in, in the Bible are always from Israel. So if you go the farthest north you can go from Israel, you're in Russia. And so what Ezekiel 38 and 39 speak of a great end time coalition, there's a leader there called Gog, and that word just means leader there called Gog. So what Ezekiel 38 and 39 speak of... What I wanted to show here was actually if you went north of Israel, like literally, if you went north of Israel, it would not touch t present day uh, Russia. It would actually pr touch present day uh, the edges of Europe, uh, the NATO. Okay. So anyway. Uh, but this is how they've been presenting it for the last hundred years. And then you'll see uh, why this is so significant. It's going to become clear on the on the longer video that I'm going to discuss. Go from Israel, you're in Russia. And so what Ezekiel 38 and 39 speak of a great end time coalition. There's a leader there called Gog, and that word just means high or exalted, probably his view of himself. G-O-G. G-O-G, Gog. Mm -hmm. And he's of the land of Magog. And these places that are listed in Ezekiel 38 are Russia, one of them is Iran, one of them is Libya, another, several of the names relate to Turkey. So a lot of these things we, we see happening in that part of the world I think are significant. And really what happened with the fall of the Soviet Union has really set things up even better. People thought, well, that's the end of that prophecy and that prophecy wasn't correct. Yeah. No, actually it's come back now and been reformed in a way that's even uh, more compelling and even more in line with what the Bible says. Let's get now to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ crisis day by day we've been talking about the prophetic timeline thousand years of peace prosperity jesus physically reigning on this earth but the question we mere mortals ask is what happens at the end of 1000 years well the, the 1000 years is what i like to call the front porch of eternity it's a phase one of god's eternal kingdom and after christ has ruled and reigned on this earth for a thousand years and fulfilled all of god's promises for this earth god is going to destroy this present heaven and earth and he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. If God spoke it all into existence. He's going to speak it all out of existence. Again, that staggers us to think of that. But God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth, a new, a new earth, a new universe. And then it tells us the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, which I take it is the abode of God right now. It's, it's where God exists. Is going to come down out of heaven from God and sit on this new earth. So 
that heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, will come down and sit on the new earth and serve as kind of like the metropolis or the capital city uh, for all of God's new creation. And we will inhabit uh, this new earth uh, the new heavens that God has created, that heavenly city, that will be the abode of, of God's people for all of eternity. And our preoccupation will be worship of God and adoration really? of God. Does the Bible reveal any other operational things that go on during the new heavens and the new earth? Not really. It tells us that we're going to reign with Him. It tells us we're going to serve Him. It tells us we're going to worship Him. And, you know, people often say, well, won't heaven be boring? Well, look at... The uh, one of the key components uh, that... Uh, evangelical Christians believe, uh, the Zionist Christians, and you'll see why it's called Zionist Christians, okay, um, is that there will be something called the rapture, which is that all the very, very best Christians, they will just wake up one day and they won't be there. They'll be just vanished. There'll be a rapture. Um, I'm going to come to that. Now I want to focus on the, uh, the Quran, inshallah. Let's go back to the Quran and make a few points that are very, very important. Because, you know, sometimes uh, in order to explain something, we emphasize something. And then when we emphasize something, then uh, people may uh, understand something differently than what was... This world we live in now, how wonderful and beautiful this world... So let me go back now to these verses and explain something very important okay so ba'da a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim alif lam mim ghulibatir rum the romans have been defeated fi adna al ard in the earth nearby in the land nearby meaning is in in jerusalem near jerusalem and they, after their defeat, will come back even more powerfully and be victorious. In a few years, and for Allah is the affair before and after. And on that day, the believers will rejoice. Okay? By the help of Allah, He helps whoever He wills. Wallahu Azizur Rahim, and he is the one who has authority, and he is the one who has mercy. Now, let me explain something. When these verses were revealed, was the Byzantine Empire an angel? That Allah is saying, My Nusra is with them. My oh. help is with them. Were these Byzantines, they were they were uh, like the Sahaba, they were like the companions of Jesus, peace be upon him. They didn't do torture. They didn't kill innocent people. They did. And the reason I mention this is because when I have talked about Russia being better than NATO, uh, the result has been that people have said, well, look at all these things that Russia has caused problems in. And yes, they have. Not close to even what NATO and its alliances have caused problems in. The Quran didn't give Nusra to the Romans because the Romans were good. Allah gave Nusra to the Romans because it was going to help the Muslims in the long run, number one. Number two, Allah gave Nusra to the Romans because they were better than the Persians. And what's the proof of that? The Prophet sent three letters to the Christian world and one letter to the Persians. What did the Persians do to the letter of the Prophet? Anybody remember? He what? Khisro tore up the letter of the Prophet, didn't even read it, and killed his ambassador. What did the Christians do? Heraclius, who, by the way, even changed his belief for some time on the idea of Trinity. Not a lot of people know this, and because uh, if I... Uh, I, I won't be able to show it today because if I try to type it up, it's going to take me maybe a little while to find those documents. But uh, he believed in something a little bit different than, uh, than Trinity until they say the moment he died and then he reverted. But um, the ambassador of the prophet to the Roman Empire was Dahya Kalbi. And Dahya Kalbi was the, one of the most beautiful companions of the Prophet Sallallahu the, the town, because now when, as Dahya Kalbi is coming in, he is 
one of the most beautiful. Uh, he he looked very close to uh, meaning Jibrail alayhi salatu wasalam, Jibrail his sunnah was to always come in the form of the person that's most beautiful in that area. Okay. And Dahyak, so Jibrail alayhi salatu wasalam also used to come to the form, to the Prophet in the form of Dahyak. And uh, there's a lot of events about this which I'm not going to go into, but only mentioning that the Prophet sent this man and the whole town came to receive. To, to receive him, to see him, to, to look at what, who's this, you know, ambassador from Arabia coming in the name of this prophet. But either way, he was very well respected. And when the prophet وسلم, went to Tabuk against the Roman Empire, what happened? Did they fight the prophet? The Hercules no, didn't no. even, they, they didn't even go. They're like, oh, we're not touching this. So they had a certain respect for the Prophet. We know what uh, Najashi, how he treated the Prophet We know how uh, the Coptic uh, Christians that were sent the letter of the Prophet, and they sent gifts to the Prophet and how they treated the Prophet. Now, please understand this from today's perspective, because the way a lot of people approach me sometimes, it seems to me that if the Coptic Christian had sent gifts to Amir al-Mu'minin today, and he took those gifts, people would be like, why are you taking gifts from a kafir? Why are you taking gifts from this, this person? Right? Why are you saying good things about Christians? Why are you interested in the, why are the Muslims in Mecca, why would they be interested in the victory of the Roman Empire over the Persians? Has nothing to do with us. Has nothing to do with us. Meaning the Sahaba are sitting there in Mecca oppressed. What does the victory of Romans have to do with the Persians? And so the Quran is saying, this matters to Allah. And if it matters to Allah, it matters to us. Right? And something that didn't matter to them mattered to them because they were like, well, Allah said this is going to happen. No one said, oh, Prophet of Allah, but they don't believe in you. Why is Allah saying, gonna, why is Allah going to give victory to the Romans? Why is Allah going to help them? And he's not helping us. We're still oppressed. Right? So we have to understand the attitude that we got to come with, right? Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, she said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supported Islam by the wars between the Persians and the Romans because the Romans and the Persians both became weak. And that's how Islam was able to conquer these areas. But it was important that the Romans win over because why? Look at the history. Do you know the damage that even the defeated Persia did to Islam? The death of who? Umar, right? The yes. Abdullah bin Sabah. And you can go on and on and on. That how the Persian Ali and Empire, as well. How the Persian Empire affected the Muslims. And had they been the dominant one and the Romans would have been defeated, it would have been terrible for Islam. So it's a similar situation. There's also a lot of other links. So first is, why should the oppressed Muslims of Mecca, Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Talha and Zubair, why should they care about the Byzantine Empire? Why, why would they not say, they don't have any morals. They kill people, innocent people. Right? So, so what do we have to do? We live in this dunya. There's fasad in the world on all sides. Right? No one is perfect. There's no khilafatul muslimin. There's no like, you know, there's no like angel coming anytime, you know, you know in, in, our, in the context of the world that we live in, you know? So in that context of facade, there's still those people that have a better, you can say disposition, a more fitra disposition, and those people that have an anti-fitra disposition, okay? Now, having said this, now let's go. Now, what did we study about the eschatology, Christian eschatology, before we go into the details? That's going to, I think, going to make everything very clear. According to the Zionist ideology of Christianity, the Russians are the bad guys. And Russians are Gog Magog. And the Russians are the ones, you'll hear this later on, the Russians are the ones that are going to come and destroy Israel. Okay, just keep this in mind. So the NATO 
the Roman Catholic Church, the Protestant Church, they believe in an idea called uh, dispensation theology, which I'm, which we're going to be talking about to, in some some in in some detail today, and then look at things from that perspective, and then see what Quran is saying, and go back to some of the verses that we discussed before from this perspective. So the Christian theology is, and I'll show you another video on this, and before we go to the uh, the final video, um, let's go to this video. This is another uh, important uh, writer. I'm joined today by Jeff Kinley. Jeff, how you doing? Doing great, Billy. Good to be with you again. Well, good to have you. You are obviously a celebrated author. How many books have you written? Oh, it's in the upper 30s. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's 30, it pl it's 30 plus. The <laughs> reason I bring that up is because of all the people out there who write on a variety of issues, and you've written on a, on a lot of issues, but prophecy is a big area of focus for you. You've done some amazing work in this arena, and right now the world is watching Russia, they're watching Ukraine, and I think a lot of people are wondering in the back of their mind, huh, what is going on here? And so what, what do you make of this Russia situation? What's your, what's your take from a, from a prophecy perspective? Yeah, what's very interesting is that, you know, here we are, we're hopefully kind of coming out of the COVID chaos crisis era that we've been in, but who knows. But that got the world thinking because, you know, at no time in my lifetime was the whole planet talking about one thing. And so we've sort of been in an upheaval. Uh, it's almost like the, these, you know, geopolitical tectonic plates are shifting all over the world. And so while on the one hand, there's calls for global unity, now we got Russia coming in and once again, trying to divide the world by invading Ukraine. So, yeah, it's got people thinking, it's got people wondering, you know, does the Bible really say anything about this? And of course, Jesus in Matthew 24, when he's talking about the latter days, the, the end times, the time of tribulation, talks about there'll be wars, rumors of wars, a nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. I don't think that's what he's talking about in this particular case, but, but it certainly is a prelude or a preview, if you will, of sort of the warm up act for things that are going to happen later on. Yeah, I know and and that's, you know, so well said. I know one of the big things, one of the big questions is, okay, well where do people find Russia in scripture? So let's start there. Is Russia in scripture? And then let's talk about Ezekiel because I know that's where you're going to go um, from here, but but take us through that. Why Russia? Yeah, well, from a biblical perspective, anytime you have directions given in the Bible, then you always start with Israel being kind of the, the center or the navel, if you will, the, the center of the compass. And it speaks about nations, these nations coming from the uttermost parts of the north. And of course, if you just do a straight line north of Israel, you're going to land in the middle of Russia. And so that's one reason. Another is because the word Rosh is used in Ezekiel chapter 38 and of course, there's different opinions uh, as to what that means, but the most, I think the most plausible explanation is that it just simply refers to Russia because it's referring geographically to it and even the name itself. Um, when you get down to like to a Magog, you know, it says there'll be this war of Gog and Magog. Uh, I know that Josephus, the Jewish historian, identified that area as the area of the Scythians where they lived, which is really modern day. So remember the brother of the Rahman, he also identified Gog and Magog with the Scythians and how they moved towards Germany. Anyway, look at what he says. Hey, uh, Russia, uh, it really includes the Ukraine, or includes Ukraine rather. And uh, so really you've got Rosh is Russia and part of Russia being uh, Magog. And all that just really fits. And most scholars today, Billy, uh, are pretty united on the fact that Magog does include uh, Russia and at least uh, parts of the former Soviet Union. Yeah, and that portion of Ezekiel, when you look at Ezekiel 38 and 39, this idea of Gog from Magog, Gog would, would then be a world leader, well, a world leader, really the leader of Russia in this case, essentially pending Russia is yeah. Magog. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. So the word Gog just simply means uh, chief or ruler or head. He's the kind of the top dog of the, um, of the organization, if you will. And so, yeah, he would be uh, identified as the leader. So it's interesting. And, and as you said, the directions, I mean, it's very clear in Ezekiel that this is a nation to 
the North, right? Now, some people, there are, there are all different perspectives on this. And obviously, just right before this in Ezekiel is the conversation in Scripture, one of the many of Israel basically coming back to fruition of having you know, the Hebrew people spread throughout the world, then coming back and having this, what seems like it, it's describing a period of um, success, right? And no famine and all of that. You know, so the idea is that is that the first part there, the Israel part, and I want you to correct any pieces of this or fill in any blanks, but the Israel part would have been fulfilled in 1948, let's say, and, and since then, but this invasion part that we're talking about, the nation to the north, would have not been fulfilled, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And, and chronologically speaking, in order to have an invasion of Israel, you have to have an Israel. So yeah. what he's talking about is the invasion of Israel by Russia. OK, so that's their eschatology. And that is the mainstream eschatology of the Protestants. That's the mainstream eschatology of even the Mormons, of the Jehovah Witnesses, uh, just the whole the whole Protestant movement. That is their eschatology, which we will go into detail about um, in, in a little bit. Yes, Israel became a nation again after. Because this is, you know, the TV version, right? This is not the academic version. This is like how they sell themselves to the public. So this is what you're watching. But then we'll get to a little bit more, uh, you can say, thorough uh, examination of this whole scenario and then compare it to what the Quran is saying. Almost 20 centuries being scattered to 70 countries, their language was dead. It's really the miracle of miracles in the end times. And that's what Ezekiel 36 and 37 talk about is that God's going to bring his people back together again. And of course, as you know, over 6 million Jews, over half of the Jews in the world now live in Israel. So then you get to Ezekiel 38, and now you've got this coalition of nations. You've got uh, Rosh and uh, you know Gog, the, the prince of Rosh, and, and Magog, and then these this list of other nations that, ironically enough, uh, turn out to be uh, Islamic nations uh, that are surrounding Israel that uh, many of them have uh, have vowed to annihilate Israel off the map. And it says those nations are going to come together with a coalition with Russia, and they're going to come against Israel. They're going to seek an invasion. But as it says, uh, Israel will be prospering at that time. And I think one of the key phrases that we see in that passage, it's mentioned twice uh, in uh, verse uh, verse 8 and verse 14, is that Israel is living securely in the land when this actual invasion takes place. So, you know, by all estimation, Israel is not necessarily living securely. So it says that there are, there are cities of unwalled villages. I don't really see that happening right now, but, um, but certainly there is a, a ramping up to that happening. Yeah. And so that that's really interesting because there are some who will look at all of this and they'll say, oh, no, both of those events that already all happened a long time ago. Right. That's that is this this other perspective on this. What would you say to those people who would say, oh, no, you know, th th it's not talking about 1948 and it's not talking about some future event when it comes to Gog from Magog. It's talking about something that happened thousands of years ago already. Yeah, I think the simple answer would just be that as you look through the rest of Scripture, you, you see zero examples of that mentioned. In other words, you would think that a victory that great against that many nations with such a supernatural deliverance that God promises in, in four different ways that he gives Israel would somehow be mentioned in some of the Jewish scriptures or in some of the apocryphal uh, writings uh, or in just in secular historical documents. We have none of those. And so that's one. Easy enough. Well, thank you, Jeff. We'll have you back sometime very soon. Thanks, Billy. Okay, so um, let me do this now. So, so far I've made two points. Number one, that facade is on both sides. But the facade on one side is number one less. Number two, one side will, its victory will be better for Muslims in the long term than the facade from the other side. The second point I may, I'm making is that Christian Zionists see Russia as the enemy and ultimately as the nation that comes to invade Israel. Okay, so now you begin to understand why there is such a deep, you can say religious hate, just like Christian Zionists love Israel. I don't have time to go into that today. Maybe we'll touch on some aspects where you can begin to see this. But this NATO American alliance, their hatred for Muslims and their hatred for Russia 
these two groups specifically, uh, is because of the threats that they read, or as they read, as you'll see, as they read the Bible, okay, as the Bible is taught to them, that this is what the Bible is saying, okay? And so therefore you find movies, even though like America is against China, but you don't see that many or any that I can remember movies that really depict Chinese as a bad people. But you'll find several movies depicting Muslims and Russia, right, as, as really bad and uh, barbaric type of people. America has problems with North Korea. You don't find any movies about uh, showing North Korea. Um, so, you know, Shaitan, if it's going to give somebody, uh, you know, Shaitan, somebody has a movie idea, Shaitan puts it in his mind, well, make it Muslim and make it Russia. It'll sell better for sure than, let's say, China, because it's, it's, it's predictive programming. People are used to certain themes being seen over and over again. But also, uh, it's, it's kind of like using space to the advantage of Shaitan that if they chose anything else. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. So these are the two points I've made so far. Number one that uh, even two Kafir countries fighting each other can in the long term benefit the Muslims. Number two, that there is a qualitative difference of the type of facade on both sides. In, in the time of the Prophet, and even today, Babylonia, okay, Babylon was the center of magic and the center of where a lot of the, the, the Jewish networks were. I don't have time to go into this right now. But if you remember, uh, the, uh, the companion of the Prophet وسلم, who was, they thought he's Dijjal. I forget his name right now, if anybody can remind me. Ibn Sayyad. Ibn Sayyad, he vanished to Iran, Babylon. So uh, the point being, in the time of the Prophet, this was the place that was, where shaitan was, uh, you can say, connected to and hurting Islam much more. Okay. Now, in this geopolitical situation, those Christians who love Israel, Zionism is part of their faith. This is the point. It is not only part of their faith. It is part of their eschatology, as you'll see. Okay. They, compared to those people that are not pro-Zionism, as you'll see, and so they are also attacking them because that Christianity is a threat to them. And they're also attacking Muslims because that is the ultimate truth. And so uh, let us now uh, talk about a few other things relating to this uh, verse of the Quran. Okay, so uh, there is a hint here now. Let's get a little bit deeper. Okay, room. Who is room proper? Okay, who is the proper room? Uh, okay, before I go into this, uh, what I wanted to do was that I've made these two points so far, and you heard the, um, the, the Christian authors talk about these two points. Um, now, is there any questions here so far? before I continue, and not more than two questions, because I don't want this to become three hours. So two questions uh, that relate to this issue, that if you think there's any clarification needed, then I can answer up to two questions, and then maybe other questions, you know, uh, I can answer later. But if this is clear, these two points, number one, Zionist Christian, Protestant Christian see Russia as their enemy. And with Gog Magog, they see the Muslim lands there helping Russia. And number two, that it is not as simple as saying it's two kafirs fighting each other. What does it have to do with us? It does have something to do with us because the, the, what does the uh, Roman Empire versus the Persian Empire have to do with the Sahaba in Mecca that are being tortured? Okay, so... As long if there's any questions on these two points, then I can try to answer. If not, then I'm going to continue to the next point. So I'm going to now continue to the next point. Okay. Oh, I think uh, if somebody has a question, they can ask in the chat because I've like, uh, okay, yeah. So 
uh, music industry to our tools of design is used to, okay, yeah, so that's not really a question. Yeah, and it makes a lot of sense. Could you say they're fighting over their ability to influence? So, uh, sir, I have a question, sir. Um, and yes, absolutely. Some, uh, some, some scholars say that uh, the NATO is the, uh, the room that, that has been, uh, uh, who has been uh, told about in the Quran. Uh, what your take on this? I'm going to discuss that very issue next. And in fact, not only many scholars, but in also including many scholars, Alama Iqbal, he also mentioned this. And this is true in the sense that there is some connection. Also, sir, uh, the Chinese have been uh, labeled as Magog by many scholars, sir. Many scholars as what? Uh, uh, not, uh, I wouldn't call them scholars, but uh, end-time end analysts, I would. Right, right. China has been, end, has been called what? Magog. Uh, oh, well, I've yeah. talked about this in great detail. Um, and so uh, you will have to look at those videos because that's a whole conversation in itself. And uh, the... Uh, Do you have, a, have any yes or no answers to this? No, no. Yeah, well, yes and no is the answer. Yes and no. So there are some descendants amongst the Chinese that relate to the the, the Khazari in, 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 in the Khazarian Gog Magog, yes. So there is some, but the major of it is the white European Jews, okay? It is the Jews who accept, it's the white people who spoke Yiddish language, came from the north to Israel. That's the primary um, uh, bulk of uh, Gog Magog, okay? Uh, that's my opinion, but again, I'm not discussing that right uh, now. Uh, do you f follow Robert Seffer's video? He he also uh, mentions some people in the underground, which actually matches with the original uh, Islamic uh, narrative that the Gog and Magog being underground. There's no such thing as Gog's Magog being underground in the Quran. It doesn't match. Sheikh, do Muslims and Christians? even understand the extent of what occurred at the Council of Nicaea as it regards to Christi Christianity? I don't know. I think most Muslims understand the basic idea of Nicaea. That's actually a good question. Uh, if but they before... do, sorry to interrupt, but if, they, if the Muslims do, they would, it, would be, it would be easy for them to recognize the Christians that we should be siding with and the ones that we should not. Yeah. So, uh, do you want to explain what you mean? Uh, oh. I have a quick question related to that subject. Okay. The, the question is, when you said uh, uh, in the past, when the Rome and uh, the, the Persian Empire, when they fought, at that time, as far as I remember, we didn't align with neither of them. You, you think Quran's not aligning with any of them? No, I, uh, I'm based on the information. We know that we did not, uh, you know, align with any, in, in neither of, we, we, with any of them. Okay. Because they so, fought. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you say that, then let me share this with you. First of all, the Quran aligns with them very clearly. Second of all, Abu Bakr, an, when he heard these ayat, he placed a bet with the leaders of Quraysh, that I bet with you, what? That the Byzantines will win in a few years. Do you know this? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so then how can you say we didn't align with one side or the other? When Abu Bakr is placing a bet, placing a bet on one side is aligning with them. I see. I, I meant like, you know, alignment that will support them in that sense. I understand you. Yeah, jazakallah khair. All right, now let us come to the other question, which is, who are the room proper? Okay. There is an idea in some parts of the Bible that there will be a Roman Empire. And this is why the idea of NATO and European Union, one of the people pushing for this, by the way, is the Pope. Because the Pope, and this is not the subject today, but I'm just simply explaining, the Pope wants to establish like a Roman religious identity uh, 
of Catholicism in Europe, in Europe. And of course, against that is the Protestants, but the idea that there is a common, Euro, uh, common Roman force exists in Christianity. And we're gonna talk about this because Putin is also a big, uh, uh, he's, he's a proponent uh, or he is an advocate uh, for that. We're gonna come to that as part of the end time um, prophecies uh, in, in the Orthodox Christianity versus the Protestant Christianity. We're going to come to that, okay? But let's first uh, also look at who is Rome proper, okay? So now we're going to look at this issue of who is the Romans uh, properly, who, who could be defined as the uh, Romes. Okay. So uh, the Byzantine Empire genetically, okay, genetically is closer to the Christians of the Eastern Bloc, okay, and Orthodox. Uh, or the Orthodox Christians, yes, and genetically, faith-wise, yeah, as the well. The family. Huh? Were their descendants? The Romanov family, the ruling uh, czars of Russia, were descendants of uh, the Roman Empire, Eastern Roman Empire. Yes. So those people, the Byzantine Empire, and then and then the Constantinople was considered the New Jerusalem. Okay, and uh, the ancient Rome. Okay, uh, if I can show this to you. Let's see if I can show it to you the other one more better. The succession of the Roman Empire. Okay. Uh, if you can. Uh, Okay, I will try to come back to this question uh, properly in a little bit, okay? This question I will come back to in a little bit, but yes, it is true that the proper, if you think of Rome in its original sense, in terms of its faith, and in terms of the type of people, the people genetically that were ruling over Syria, and in the area of Tabuk, uh, the Byzantine Empire being over Constantinople, that is more properly the Eastern Bloc of the West, not the Western Bloc of the West, okay? So the Western Bloc of the West was where a lot of the, you know, the, um, you know, the Vikings and the Celtics, and they weren't really organized as that, at that time as, as, as governments. They were actually fighting against some of these uh, the Byzantine empires and the Roman empires and so on and so forth. Okay, but now I want to uh, go into another aspect of this and then I'll come back to Rome proper. Let me see if I can get it here. Um, Moscow, Third Rome, a theological political concept asserting that Mos Moscow is the center of the Roman Empire, presenting, representing, now this is very important, the Third Rome, because it's part of their eschatology of both sides, that Rome would become united, okay? And so uh, representing a Third Rome in succession of the First Rome and the Second Rome, capital of the Eastern Rome, the Byzantine Empire, okay? So we know the Byzantine Empire uh, is, uh, is directly linked, you can say, with this Eastern Bloc of Christianity. Okay, having said that, now let's go to the uh, next part. Um,
So I'm going to play this guy. Uh, Christians in my parish come up. So this is uh, a, a study of Protestant or Zionist Christianity versus Orthodox Christianity. Okay. It's a little bit long. I'm going to put it on a faster speed so we can listen to it a little bit faster. And then I'll interject wherever I think it's needed to be interjected. And then we'll get, try to make a under overall understanding of what's happening at least at the in from the uh, in the world from the perspective of end times. Okay. To me, and ask questions like this, uh, Father. I was talking to my my uh, evangelical friend, and she asked me about the rapture. What I believed about the rapture. What is the rapture? I've never heard of this term. Or sometimes I've had other people come up to me and say, Father, uh, uh, I have a question for you. Um, there's some activity going on in the Middle East. There's fighting breaking out between Israel and some of Israel's neighbors. So my friends all say that this is part of Bible prophecy, that this is, this is a sign of the end of the world. Is this true? Please explain this to me. So this interaction between Orthodox and evangelical Christians on the end times uh, points out two things. One is that we Orthodox, for whatever reason, don't talk about the subject of the end times very often. It's just not, uh, we have our beliefs, certainly, uh, but it's not something that we highlight either in our too many of our sermons or in our Christian education classes at every level. Uh, conversely, our evangelical friends sometimes come from uh, specific backgrounds where discussion of the end times is a major part of their faith. Many sermons on the subject, many uh, classes and uh, that talk about the end times. So this is uh, the subject of the end times is something where evangelicals usually have very specific and strong views and the Orthodox really uh, have kind of a blank slate in that regard. So the purpose of this class is actually uh, by my primary focus audience is for Orthodox Christians and uh, help them understand and, and, and uh, give them a better understanding of what it is that Orthodoxy believes about the end times and, and be aware of the differences between how Orthodox view the end times versus our evangelical friends. Uh, if you are evangelical, and, and we'll see more specifically refine that to to dispensationalist evangelicals, and you're watching this, um, my, you're welcome to this class. I appreci appreciate your presence. Uh, some of this stuff when I'm describing dispensational uh, theology would be very familiar to you, but it would be completely new uh, material for most Orthodox Christians. And there will be times where we, I highlight our agreements, and there will be times where I highlight. Now, this idea of... Um dispensational Christianity and dispensational theology is at the heart of this whole issue. It is the a very important term for Muslims to know. It's called dispensational theology. And this is the, the most satanic part of it all. It's, it's, it's the thing that uh, really divides the line. And you're going to see what this is. Okay, And this is the main difference. Uh, and everything that's a result of it is the main difference between Protestant Christianity, evangelical Christianity, Zionist Christianity versus Orthodox Christianity. So you're going to see this, and then we're going to look at this other verse of the Quran in the light of this. So just keep in mind, this is very, very important from that perspective. I like our differences, and so my purpose is to be respectful and not to um, try to t uh, convince evangelical <laughs> dispensationalists in uh, their views of the end times. If you're an evangelical and you firmly believe in the dispensational approach to the end times, my purpose here is not necessarily to convince you to change your mind on the subject, uh, but uh, my primary purpose is to teach Orthodox by uh, compare and contrast uh, where we are similar and where we are very different. And so uh, the, we, that is uh, the, the focus of this class. Now, we start with the earliest days of the church. The early Christians firmly believed that they were living in the end times. We see plenty of biblical evidence for this. And our Lord said... So one thing about Jesus, peace be upon him, 
specifically is, both in the Quran as well as in the Christian literature, one of the common points is that Jesus is a prophet that is specifically, you can say, his view, his approach, his focus is the end times, both in his life before and in his uh, continuing life when he comes back. Uh, in, in this case, John chapter 14, 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So this is one of many occasions where our Lord told his followers, told his disciples and then apostles that he would return. And so that has been a, 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 a very important part of the Christian faith ever since the uh, ascension and ever since Pentecost. Now, the early Christian view uh, of end time continues in other passages that certainly teach us that the earliest Christians, for the first few decades of Christianity, they firmly expected Christ to come back during their lifetime. Uh, sometimes theologically, they call that the imminent return, or, the, the, or uh, more commonly, the any day now uh, approach to when Christ will come back. So here are some verses that point out this, this understanding of Christ's possibly coming in our lifetime. Therefore, be, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. So this this for the coming of the Lord is at hand and the judge standing at the door certainly uh, tells us that James expected the return of Christ to come at any time. Peter, uh, in his uh, early days of his ministry, certainly had the exact same understanding. He writes, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And so Peter also having that understanding of the imminent return of Christ. And also in the first epistle of John, and now little children abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And so this continues, more verses about this imminent return of Christ. Romans, the apostle Paul writing, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to await. Uh. Let me speed this up, inshallah. So if we speed this up, it'll be better, inshallah. Uh, let's see how I can... Take out of our sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let me know if Peter, you again, fast. Peter, his first epistle. And when the chief priest appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Hebrews. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more, as you see the day approaching. Obviously, the writer of the Hebrews said, you will see, implying that most of you will see that day approaching, the returning of Christ. Titus, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So over and over again, we see this understanding, this belief amongst the earliest Christians that Christ could come as soon as their lifetimes before they left this earth. But uh, with the passage of several decades after Christ's ascension and after Pentecost, the early Christians came to understand that the return of Christ may happen after their lifetimes. In fact, Peter later on in his life, as he sees his own uh, end approaching, he writes the following. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. So now he sees his decease coming, and now he's, he's stressing the importance of remembering what he witnessed, what he saw, and what he's recording for all time that is enshrined in the scriptures. Paul says the same thing in toward approaching the end of his earthly sojourn. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. So Paul, again, preparing for his death, realized that Christ may return after his death. This is a subtle shift from a few decades earlier as they began their apostolates. Now, what is it that the Orthodox Church believes about the end times? Uh, this would be a common question uh, from our evangelical friends. I'm sure we're very puzzling to them uh, because we don't talk enough about the end times and what we believe. If, uh, if you are Orthodox or non-Orthodox, here is a summary of our belief in the end times. And he will come in glory 
again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. Now we believe more than this, but this is a summation of our beliefs. It's one of the lines in our Nicene Creed that we recite every Sunday and Sunday, and sometimes at our other non-Sunday services as well. So we do believe that Christ will return. We also definitely do believe that he will raise the dead when he returns. And we also understand that he will establish a kingdom of his own under his authority in heaven and on earth, and that kingdom shall never pass away. So this is something that uh, is in our faith. And so we Orthodox. So this is a kind of common between all Christian groups and to some lesser degree common with all the Muslims. So up till here, everything is fine until they start talking about dispensationalism, which is completely satanic. Now you'll see that, inshallah. I think I could, could improve uh, a little bit on our, our focusing upon these things and being aware of this part of the creed that we recite uh, every Sunday. Now, the straight, simple, straightforward belief about the end times, and which we have, as Orthodox have held since the fourth century, since the uh, codifying of our faith, the summary of our faith and the Nicene Creed, is largely shared by the Catholic West. Uh, if, you were to ask, if you were to compare the Orthodox view and the Catholic view uh, on the end times, it's pretty much the same. Might be some differences here and there, uh, but yet it is uh, it, our our common heritage uh, with the West shows the fact that uh, there's fairly little disagreement between Orthodox and, and Catholics on the end times as far as this goes. And uh, it might be a, a surprise to some people that this this faith, that the rather simple, straightforward understanding of Christ returning, raising the dead, judging all, and then beginning his eternal reign forever, uh, it was, was largely shared also by the Protestant reformers of the 16th century. And so up until fairly recently in history, there has been not that much debate. I mean, Protestants and Orthodox can have debated over many things over the centuries, but up until the 18th century, 19th century, excuse me, uh, there was not that much disagreement in the, the broad strokes of what would, what uh, the, the form reformers believed would happen in the end times as compared to the Orthodox. However, a new and very different set of beliefs about the end times appeared in the 19th century. And, that and this is now the important part and the implications of this and why they believe Russia will attack Israel. Okay, so all of this will now come in to here. A new set of beliefs or system of beliefs, as some have called it, uh, has since become the dominant doctrine, among, particularly among evangelical Protestants today. And that new doctrine about the end times is called dispensationalism. And this doesn't mean that all evangelicals are dispensationalists. That is not true. I'm not implying that. Uh, however, those who believe in dispensationalism are overwhelmingly uh, evangelical Christians. So I will, uh, I will refer to dispensationalists and dispensationalism pretty much from here on out with that understanding. Now, what is this dispensationalism? So this will be a, this would be an education, I think, to most Orthodox, uh, for most evangelical slash dispensationalists, this would be a uh, very familiar territory. So what is dispensationalism? Dispensationalism is a series of very specific beliefs about the end times. Its most defining characteristics include, first, a strictly literal interpretation of all scripture. Second, it holds to sola scriptura, the belief that each Christian can <coughs> correctly interpret the Bible on their own. Third, it divides all... Now, let me explain to you why this is satanic. Each Christian can interpret the Bible on their own. This is the same phenomenon that's taking place with the guy, Marvelous Quran. Like I can just go into the Quran and uh, interpret things based upon hidden secrets called Balthania. Uh, but basically the spirit, the jinn, the angel, whatever comes to me and tells me this is what the Bible is saying. So they're opening themselves up to like Shaitan coming to you and telling you what the Bible is saying. Okay, so this, and you see this, like if you're studying this whole movement, the evangelical movement in America, if you're studying it, you could tell, uh, if you study John Hagee, for example, if you study B Billy Graham, for example, it becomes very clear that shaitan's literally coming to them and they're thinking, oh, Allah is guiding us because now they've opened themselves up to, we'll open ourselves up to let God tell us what this is saying rather than we want, to understand the word of Allah from what Allah is saying uh, in a way that's coherent to the whole book. Uh, they're opening themselves up to other channels that allows them other interpretations. Okay, so just keep going uh, on this. Well, all of human history between creation and the last judgment into a series of dispensations. Just there, they use the term dispensationalist, dispensations from as the English translation of the Greek word economia, which means the order of a household. Uh, next, uh, dispensationalists- uh, very Order of the household is not very different from the idea of the new world order, but they do it also like in a historical way, which you'll see inshallah. Very somewhat, but 
on, on this question, but the number of dispensations that dispensationalists believe in varies a little bit. Uh, it's usually some falls between seven and eight, and it sort of depends on which dispensationalist uh, theologian or writer or teacher uh, you, you are talking about. But uh, the, the, these are the, the most common defining characteristics. There are a few more, which we'll talk about. Now, according to their literature, you know, I'm, I, it's not my purpose here to put straw men in anybody. I don't want to uh, misquote or misrepresent dispensationalists in any way uh, about what they believe. So I quote a few of their own uh, authorities on this subject. So according to dispensationalist literature, and in this case from the, the Schofield Study Bible, it says the following. Each dispensation is a period of time during which <coughs> man is tested in respect of obedience to some specific revelation of the will of God. Seven such dispensations, dispensations are distinguished in scripture. One can define dispensationalism as God's distinctive method of governing him, uh, mankind or a group of men during a period of human history marked by a crucial event, test, failure, and judgment. From the divine standpoint, it is a stewardship, a rule of life, or a responsibility for managing God's affairs in his house. From the historical standpoint, it is a stage in the progress of revelation. This is from the Schofield, Schofield Biblical Institute. Now, what does this all mean? Hopefully these graphs, now dispensationalists love graphs because it puts their beliefs into an understandable vis visual way. So this is a, a graph that I took, uh, copied and pasted from a dispensationalist uh, website. So it should be a fair representation, excuse me. According to dispensationalism, there are seven or eight dispensations. The chart below is from a dispensational uh, so as you see, it begins with creation, ends with eternity. So the first dispensation, according to dispensationalists, uh, basically ran from creation to the fall of man, uh, which they, this place is at about 4,000 BC. Uh, that's the age of innocence. And then came the dispensation of the conscience. That's from the fall of man to the flood. Uh, then from the flood to the call of Abraham was the era of human government. And as you can see from this chart, the, the dispensation of human government continues uh, all the way up to the present day. It's sort of an underlying of everything else, as you can see, as described by this chart. Uh, then beginning with the call of Abraham, and lastly, until the law of Moses, uh, we have the dispensation of promise. And then from uh, the handing down of the law uh, to Moses from Mount Sinai and, and given and followed by the I hope all of this makes sense because it is kind of interesting, but you'll see the um, uh, you'll see how this this all relates to Israel and Israel becomes the center of everything as a result of this. The Old Testament people of God, the Israelites, that began the dispensation of the law. Then uh, the next great shift came, depending on who you were talking to, uh, the dispensation of the law uh, ended sometime after the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit. So in the beginning, the Old Testament is the law, and then the New Testament comes, removes the law, says there is no law, there's only belief in Christ, and that he died for your sins. Okay, so this is kind of like where it's going. So some people put that at that day, some, as you can see, whoever put this chart together, uh, says that the dispensation of the law slowly faded out and the dispensation of grace uh, filtered back, filtered in. And that happened sometime, according to this chart, uh, between uh, the life of the Apostle Paul and the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. That you might see differences in between uh, various dispensationalists. So then since the temple, and uh, including where we, according to dispensationalists, where we are today is in that uh, dark purple there, which is the dispensation of grace. So that's what, according to the dispensationalists, that's where we are right now. That's our present status. And that will continue until uh, uh, the next event that will change, the next, bring in the next dispensation is what the dispensationalists call the rapture. We'll talk a lot more rapture about Rapture is where... Um the good Christians will be taken into like a spaceship by Allah. Okay. So the ra rapture is the idea that you'll wake up. If you, you'll wake up one day and your religious grandma won't be there. And uh, the whole world will be missing like a few thousand or a few hundred thousand people. And we won't have any way of explaining it. Okay. So they went to God, they went to Jesus. And then uh, that's when Jesus comes back. Okay. But to do that, they need to do certain things. Uh, including establish the state of Israel, establish the third temple. Uh, they have to. They have to do a few things, which we're going to talk about. About that later, and then after the rapture, there will be seven years. Uh, what they call the just the great uh, the great tribulation, and that will be seven years. And then that dispensation will give way to the next dispensation, which will be the, the what's usually called the millennium. In this chart, is called the kingdom, and that will be from when Christ returns until a uh, later great white throne. Uh, which will begin eternity. So those are your dispensations. I see one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. So that's the eight dispensations uh, that that dispensationalists talk about. Now, the Schofield Bible Institute continues. What, what constitutes a dispensation? What makes that up? Um, according to the Schofield Bible Institute, each dispensation has been provided uh, as a responsibility to God. In each dispensation, first they are given a test from God. In each dispensation, man fails the test. And the next aspect of it is for each dispensation, God has provided a judgment. And then the fourth and final aspect of every dispensation, God has provided a measure of grace for each dispensation. So, for example, to see how that works in this dispensational understanding of how the system works. So the first dispensation was innocence. And in this dispensation, uh, the, God started with the cycle. The first step, the test. God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and gave them all the fruit to eat except the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the test. And then came the failure. The failure was Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate the forbidden fruit. Then there comes the third part of, of every dispensation, the judgment. 
In this case, God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden and into a fallen world. And then fourth is God's uh, grace. And that is, in this case, God provided a way for them to return to paradise. Uh, here's another example of how dispensationalism works as seen through the fifth dispensation. Uh, the fifth dispensation was, as they describe it, the law. The test was God giving Moses the law, which God requ required the Israelites to obey. Second came the failure. And that is, the, the Israelites disobey God's law and their disobedience culminated in their rejection of Christ as their Messiah. And then comes the judgment. The judgment of God in this dispensation is God creating a new people of, of God, the church. And then finally, uh, in this dispensation of the law, the grace is God provides a way for his Old Testament people to return to him. So hopefully this gives you a series of seven or eight dispensationalism and I'll go through this cycle of, of test, failure, judgment, and then uh, renewed grace in some form. Now, to really understand for our Orthodox uh, people for whom this is all brand new material. Uh, very so this is now the key, okay? It's the God's plan for Israel and the church. So the Orthodox Christians, they have nothing to do with Israel. Okay, they, they, they just, it, it's, it's past history in a sense. But for the uh, evangelicals, the Protestants, the Catholics, this is all very important part of uh, what they believe. Very important feature of dispensationalism that you got to bear in mind at all times, and that is this, that a defining characteristic of dispensationalism is their belief that God has two separate people, Israel and the church. The two are entirely separate. Certain Bible verses and passages refer to Israel, while other others refer to the church. And it is up to the leading dispensationalist te teachers and writers and theologians to understand the difference. So this, this distinction between Israel and the church, between the, uh, the, a Jewish person and a Gentile, is absolutely essential to, to understanding dispensationalist, dispensationalism uh, for Orthodox. We'll talk a lot more about that as well. Now, Louis Berry Chafer was one of the early theologians and leading theologians of dispensationalism. And he puts it this way, this, this church versus Israel duality. He writes, the dispensationalist believes that throughout the ages, God is pursuing two distinct purposes, one to the earth with earthly people and earthly objectives involved, which is Judaism, while the other is related to heaven with heavenly people and heavenly objectives involved, which is Christianity. So right from the very beginning, you see this, this uh, duality between uh, Judaism or Israel and the church. So this is my chart that I put together to try to make this easy for uh, Orthodox Christians who are unfamiliar with all this to understand uh, how this works. So the duality of the church and Israel is shown in the following dispensational chart. So you have the same seven dispensations as in the previous chart. But above it, you see the timeline, you see where creation falls in, you see Abraham and Moses and Christ, where we are now, uh, what evangelical dispensations call the rapture, and then the second coming. Uh, so you see that the first three dispensations, there wasn't, an, there wasn't an Israel yet. It was before Abraham, who was the father of it. So where Israel is on this church, that's where we are right now. It's the, it's the time between the grace and the tribulation, okay? And in that time, Israel plays a big role, and they have to establish the state of Israel, number one they have to establish the third temple, okay? So this, is, so their view is this duality between Israel and the rise of Israel and, and the prosperity of Israel. And that's what you have to do on earth. That's your job on earth as Christians, is to help Israel. And in the hereafter, your salvation in the hereafter relates to the church. So this is how... In the last 20th century, the, uh, the end times was changed, okay? It's not simply like in the Orthodox Christianity, Jesus is just coming back. In the evangelicals, you have to help Israel. That is God's plan for earth, okay? As long as there is an earth, you have to help Israel, okay? And so... Israel. And so from the first three dispensations, God is basically doing, dealing with all humanity, basically with Gentiles, i.e. not Jews. And then the next two dispensations, promise and law, God's work, God's people are Israel, the, the physical des descendants of Abraham. And then the next dispensation, the one of grace, where we are now, uh, Israel has been put on the back burner, so to speak. And now the church has been inserted uh, to uh, at least temporarily replace Israel as God's, uh, God's primary people. You see how it says Gentiles, Israel, church, Israel, and then Israel and church. So when Moses, from Moses to Jesus, is Israel. That's the focus. Then the church. Then again, when tribulations come, meaning when the fitans come, when the fitans come, that means you have to focus on Israel again. Okay, so this is how evangelical Christians look at their end times. But then after what the dispensation was called the rapture, which will be their next event on their calendar, uh, uh, then the church will be raptured. The church will be in a moment removed from earth, leaving Israel. And so instead of being sort of side by side in a way, the church has now been raptured. So Israel returns to its former place as God's earthly people. And so you see that is the church is kind of sandwiched in between two periods of history. Uh, the end of the rise of Israel will be the second coming of Jesus. So the rise of Israel, and then 
uh-huh. certain things that need to be done to help yeah, Israel. Need to rest. Both of which are where God's primary people are Israel. And in fact, the dispensational theologians all recognize this, and so they call the church, some of them call the church a parenthesis, meaning God had Israel, didn't work out, inserted now into the church, and the church will run its course, and then the church will be removed, and then the, there will be the closed parenthesis, and then things will return back to Israel as being God's uh, chosen people, as it was in Old Testament times. And then finally, we have the millennium, and that's the last dispensation, and even there, Israel and the church are kept separate. Uh, Israel are, is God's earthly people, as we saw from Lewis Berry Schaefer, and the church is God's heavenly people. And uh, they might disagree as to how that all works out, but that's the general scheme of how Jew and Gentile, uh, Israel and the church, kind of interact over the course of all these, these, these dispensations. Now, uh, how does that relate to orthodoxy? Along with the dispensationalists, orthodoxy also believes in progressive revelation. We also believe, as orthodox, that God reveals himself gradually over time. But in contrast to dispensationalists who divide all human history into seven or eight dispensations, and they place a great emphasis on that. That's why they call themselves dispensationalists, is because they're very focused on the, these seven dispensations, that dispensations. The Orthodox Church believes really, when it finally comes down to it, the Orthodox Church believes in only two dispensations. One would be the Old Testament, and the other would be the New Testament. Now, dispensationalists play great emphasis on the differences between their seven or eight dispensations. That's why they chose the name. By contrast, Orthodox play great, place a great emphasis on the unity of the Old Testament and the New Testament. To us Orthodox, the purpose of the which Old Testament... Which is why they follow parts of the law, which is why their women cover their head, which is why they follow the law, because the law is in the Old, temple, in the Old Testament. And so they come, they kind of like bring together the Old Testament and the New Testament. Testament is to prepare for the coming of Christ. And the purpose of the New Testament is to point back to the coming of Christ. Christ's, uh, his con- conception, his birth, his life, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension. Uh, and we, I guess we should also add Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. These are the defining events of salvation history. This, the, whole, old, the best and highest function of the Old Testament is to point towards that, and the best and highest purposes of the New Testament is to point back to that. While recognizing some of the differences in God's dealings with mankind over time, orthodoxy, Orthodox considers any such difference to be of fairly little consequence by comparison to the unity of the Testaments. Now, again, we do believe in progressive revelation. Certainly, we would readily and happy to, be, happy to believe, for example, that when Moses descended from the, the mountain, uh, having met God and receiving the Ten Commandments, and when he gave that to the people of God, that was a big difference. That was a big change. That, that, that was a major event that was, was to uh, affect everything in terms of God's Old Testament people. So we do believe happily, uh, enthusiastically, with progressive revelation. But yet, from the Orthodox perspective, uh, the main event is the unity of salvation history, focusing upon Christ. Uh, the other differences, while real, are for us not particularly uh, as important as the coming death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. So, to put it in a, in a graph here. So you see the seven dispensations uh, in, or in red, and so the, the same ones that we've been working with thus far. And uh, the timeline, starting with creation, ending with what, the, uh, what they call the second coming. And in the middle, we, we both believe in the virgin birth, res- crucifixion, and resurrection of Christ, and as well as followed up by Pentecost. But you can see, here's the difference, that I, as I would graphically put it. Everything before Christ is more or less variations of the most important thing. Christ is coming. And then everything in the New Testament, uh, you see from the Orthodox gold perspective, in, in gold, uh, to us, the most important thing is Christ has come, Christ has died, Christ has risen as our, uh, some of our West, Western friends say in, in uh, Catholicism. And so the, this, this is the difference. This is the first difference is the, whether the emphasis is on unity of, of the, te- uh, the Old and New Testament, the unity of God's revelation to man, or whether, we are gonna, or, or whether it's divided up into uh, seven um, separate events. So that's, I would say, one of the major differences between orthodoxy and Christianity. So where did dispensationalism come from? Uh, the next uh, few minutes we'll talk about... Uh, now, this is very important what he's about to discuss here. So inshallah. And then you'll see all this will tie back to whole the whole Russia, Ukraine, Putin. All this will go back to that. Where it came from, a very brief summarized history of dispensationalism. And um, then we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, uh, compare that also with orthodoxy. Now, uh, dispensationalism began uh, in uh, the late 1800s and its founder was a, a man named John Darby. Uh, Darby, well, you can see his dates there on this slide. He was an Anglo-Irish Bible teacher and founder of the Plymouth Brethren denomination. He's also considered to be the father of dispensationalism and by dispensation uh, and through dispensationalism, also this modern uh, Protest, evangelical Protestant interest in the end times that uh, c- certainly very powerful uh, to this day. A couple of uh, interesting things. My grandfather was from the same part of Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland, that John Darby was. My father, my grandfather uh, was a, uh, a preacher and very much in the footsteps. I, I know he didn't meet Darby. This is one of the other gifts of England is uh, this, dispens- this idea of dispensationalism, which ultimately means help Israel, as you'll see because Darby died the year my grandfather was born, amazingly. Uh, but, uh, so this, this has family history for me also. Also, the, uh, uh, Darby was the founder of a, a Protestant um, group called the Plymouth Brethren. Um, I was raised in the Plymouth Brethren. This is, uh, so this is my, my spiritual uh, uh, 
formation began in the Plymouth Brethren. And so this is because I grew up in the Plymouth Brethren and the teachings of dispensation and uh, uh, John Nelson Darby were so strong in the Plymouth Brethren. That's why I have a certain amount of background more, more than you, you would see in most uh, Orthodox clergy. So uh, Darby's similar contemporaries. It's important to understand that one thing about dispensationalism is it was actually part of a broader movement. Uh, at the, at, interestingly, at that time in history, there were a lot of groups that were also springing up all over the Western world, uh, not Orthodox, but certainly in the Protestant West, uh, they were suddenly very fascinated with and uh, with the end times and were coming up with uh, their their own take on what will happen. And so Darby's uh, dispensationalism uh, came out of, of this broader society-wide movement. Darby was not the only religious leader from the late 18th, late 19th century to found a new Protestant movement with a profound interest in the end times. Several other religious leaders also founded sects, preaching new and novel doctrines about the future at about the same time as Darby. So let's look at some of these. One of this, uh, which is some, some surprising, and that right about the same time Darby was 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 coming up with some uh, eschatological or some specific and fairly uh, new uh, understandings of the end times, uh, that he was doing that in Ireland and here in the United States at the same time, uh, this new religion called Mormonism uh, was doing something very similar. There's a lot of similarities here. Joseph Smith and Brigham Young were the, the credit as being two of the-, the uh, Mormonism has a great influence in America, especially in the media and so on and so forth. The founders of Mormonism also in the late 1800s. Uh, Mormons believe that Christ will return and will be seen by all. He will raise all the dead and judge humanity. The evil will go into outer darkness. The most righteous Mormons will inherit uh, what they call the celestial kingdom. Uh, it goes on to say, my source says that Brigham Young, Herbert C. Kimball, Joseph Fielding Smith, and all associated becoming like our heavenly father with the creation of worlds and the population of these worlds with spirit children. I won't go into great detail about Mormonism and what they believe about the end times, but I do see a, a similarity between that they have sort of an earthly an earthly people and, uh, and a heavenly people. And so that, that, that distinction and that doctrine of, of having uh, two different people, one heavenly and one earthly, does remind me a little bit of some of the things that, that Darby was saying. Um, to go on a little bit more about what uh, Mormonism says about the end times. The partially righteous will stay on earth in the terrestrial kingdom. This includes people who did not accept the Mormon faith, but did after death. The least righteous, those who did not accept Mormon Mormonism, either in life or death, but were not deserving of the outer darkness, are sent to this terrestrial kingdom. So you see that heavenly versus terrestrial uh, duality in Mormonism as well as you see it in dispensationalism. Um, to continue, Mormonism teaches a millennium, a literal 1,000 year period after Christ returns, when Christ rules over all the earth, and it is an age of near perfection like the Garden of Eden, and Satan will be bound. So that is very, very close to what dispensationalism teaches. A thousand year literal reign of Christ over earth, a, a time of almost return to the Garden of Eden, Eden and will, uh, when Satan will be bound. After the millennium, according to Mormonism, there will be one last angelic and human rebellion. Christ will crush the rebellion, resurrect the earthly dead, and judge all earthly humanity, and eternity will begin. That's very close to what dispensationalism, uh, as, as formulated by Darby, says. Uh, that there's another group that came about also about the same time, mainly in the late 1800s, and that is the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus Christ has been ruling in heaven as king since 1914, a date they believe was prophesied in scripture. So one of the common features of this Zionist Christianity Protestant Christianity versus Orthodox is that they completely believe we're on earth for another thousand years, right? They completely believe Jesus is going to come rule the world. If you're too pious, you're going to go into a spaceship. You're going to go, you're going to have the rapture, but if you're partially good, you're not, you have some good and some bad, then you'll be on earth and you'll rule. You'll be with Jesus on earth forever. Okay. Especially the Jehovah witnesses, they believe you'll be on earth forever. They don't even believe in the the, what we call the hereafter they don't even have a concept they just say jesus comes down and he rules forever and then if i ask them okay but you just said the good ones are going to go to heaven so why why wouldn't why would they go to heaven when jesus is on earth and so anyway this this whole uh, debate is there so it's it's a very weird thing but the the applied end times if you say there's like an applied physics or applied mathematics applied end times is you have to support israel okay and you have to support zionism and so this uh let's continue inshallah i don't want this to become too boring but it is important to go through this at least once to get a basic understanding and after that time a period of cleansing occurred resulting in god's selection of bible students associated with charles taze russell russell to be his people in 1919 uh, there were some predictions of the future, though Jeho Jehovah's Witnesses, particularly in those days, were also very interested and fascinated by the end times and made uh, what they felt was predictions based on their understanding of scripture and what was going to happen next. So in 1911, Russell wrote that the October, uh, that October 1914 would witness the full end of Babylon, or nominal Christianity, utterly destroyed as a system. He wrote that the coming of Armaged culmination of Armageddon would occur in 1914, preceded by the gathering of all the saints, both resurrected and living, to heaven. He also <coughs> predicted the destruction of governments in 1920. He also included new predictions for 1925, including the resurrection of the biblical patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and other Old Testament personages. During the 1960s and early 1970s, witnesses were instructed by means of articles in their literature <clears throat> and at their assemblies that Armageddon and Christ's thousand year millennial reign could, could begin by 1975. So again, uh, very that this was an era of intense 
interest in the end times and a lot of formulation of hypotheses. Uh, see the same thing, Mary Baker Eddy and Christian Science, late 1800s. Christian Science was developed in the in 19th century New England by Mary Baker Eddy. This uh, Christian Science is a very important organization and magazine that they have that's had a uh, very profound effect on Christianity. It mostly discusses issues of Christianity and science, but they've had a big impact and they are 100% with the Zionist agenda. Who argued in her 1875 book, Self, Science and Health, that sickness is an illusion that can be corrected by prayer alone. The book became Christian Science's central text, along with the Bible, and by 2001, it sold over 9 million copies. So here's some Christian Science beliefs about the end times, and these are quoted from their website. <coughs> and you can say this fascination of the, of the role of Christian Science in apocalypse and the end of time and what the prophetic literature, is, uh, mean, the literature means. Uh, they quote Revelation 12.1 here. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. In Revelation, they see the finality of prophecy. To their understanding, the woman of the apocalypse, apocalypse stands in type for the female of God's creation spoken of in Genesis. We, that is Jehovah's Witnesses, believe Mary Baker Eddy represents the second coming of Christ. Another group, also about the same time, uh, beginning uh, in the late 1800s, uh, began with William Miller, and who was the founder of the Seventh-day Adventists. William Miller proclaimed that Jesus Christ would return to earth by 1844 in what he called the Advent. His study of the, of the book of Daniel, a chapter eight prophecy, led him to the conclusion that Daniel's cleansing of the sanctuary was cleansing of the world from sin when Christ would come on October 22nd, 1844. He and his many followers prepared, but the day came and went. It has been since known by the Seventh-day Adventists as the great disappointment. So that is a, a brief summary. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the more modern um, uh, the Before we go on talking about Schofield Bible, which is going to be the most important part of all of this, because it has everything to do with Israel. But I'm showing you here all these people that are Christians and looking at the Bible in terms of end times, each and every one of them has failed over and over and over again. Over and over again. John, all the way down to John Hagee and his, uh, what was it, the Blood Moon. Uh, prophecies that he was making. I think most of you must have heard of the blood moon concept. They all failed, every one of these. So like to, to put too much weight on Christian eschatology, especially with dispensationalism right there in the center, uh, to place uh, too much emphasis on what Christian uh, end time thinkers are thinking or saying, we should keep in mind uh, that they have a very bad history of prediction, okay? And, uh, and so, so that, that's that. Now, this is the, one of the main points that uh, I want to talk about, about the current situation and how it relates to end-time prophecies. Some things that have happened more close to our time since the late 1800s, but you can see that uh, the broader uh, intense interest across certainly the European and American West uh, as a, the seeing and interpreting the Bible for all kinds of uh, interpretations that, that were basically uh, certainly uh, unprecedented. Now back to dispensationalism. <clears throat> what happened after the, the beginning of dispensationalism as it was taught by uh, John Darby and his followers? <clears throat> as one of several 19th century futuristic movements preaching new doctrines about the rapture, tribulation, Israel, Armageddon, and the millennium, dispensationalism was originally a rather small movement. However, dispensationalism went mainstream within Protestantism by the publication of the Schofield Study Bible. What is the Schofield Study Bible? Uh, if you are a dispensationalist, you know all about the Schofield Study Bible. Uh, if you're Orthodox, you probably never heard of it. <clears throat> this first Schofield Study Bible was edited and published by Cyrus I. Schofield. It first appeared in 1909 and was revised by the author in 1917. It was the first Bible where the editor's commentary on each verse or passage was footnoted at the bottom of the page. And I want to say, if you look at this Schofield Bible, and you should, starting from Genesis, number one, okay? All the footnotes, they all talk about one thing, mostly. Okay, they talk about a lot of other things, but the most common theme in the Schofield Bible is the importance and the centrality of Israel. Okay. Page. It was a new and powerful innovation. It placed the editor's dispensational commentary so close to the biblical text that the two seem, began to seem indistinguishable to the reader. And so this was a this innovation and very powerful one. Uh, then the, another development in dispensationalism since Darby uh, was in the 1920s, and that was uh, by Louis, Louis Sperry Chafer. As, as I have uh, already described, I'll talk a little bit about him, quoted him. He was a leading theologian of the early dispensational movement. He founded Dallas Theological Seminary in 1924 to produce dispensational pastors, theologians, and writers. It remains the theological headquarters of dispensationalism and has inspired many similar schools. Another personal note, uh, I attended Dallas Theological Seminary uh, for two years, so uh, that was very much uh, in keeping with uh, my Plymouth brethren and very dispensationalist upbringing. So uh, when you say Dallas Theological Seminary, I remember quite well as a student. Next thing that came along, now we're up to the 1970s. In 1970, 
Uh, the dispensationalist author Hal Lindsey wrote the book, The Late Great Planet Earth. It taught dispensational beliefs about the end times, including the Antichrist, the Rapture, the Seven Year Great Tribulation, and Armageddon. He cited world events at the time as proof these prophecies were about to take place. It was written in understandable, easy to read style that, that uh, was, was wild, widely popular. According to the New York Times, it was the biggest selling nonfiction book of the 19th. This book, he doesn't go into this because he's not looking at it from that perspective, but this book, the whole issue of the Great Tribulation, the whole issue of Armageddon, the whole issue of antichrist and jesus coming back every one of those issues the main issues has to do with the state of israel and i'm going to show this in in more detail in a little bit 1970s so if you were i was in my uh, teen, teens beginning in the 1970s and i remember this book very well and i remember what, reading it with great interest and so being the, the biggest selling nonfiction book for an entire decade uh he, this was a huge and very powerful reason why dispensationalism has become such such a predominant uh view of prophecy and end times uh here in the united states then that was the 1970s. Now we're up to the 1990s. Those and, uh, of us that are maybe in our 30s or 40s and 50s uh, will remember this uh, movie, Left Behind. It was very, very famous when I was in high school. If you are not uh, old enough to remember uh, the late Great Planet Earth, you are probably old enough to remember the Left Behind series of books and movies. Uh, and that came out, these came out uh, in very fairly close to our own times. And another major contributor to the popularity of dispensationalism was the Left Behind uh, was the book Left Behind by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. This 1995 novel depicts life on Earth, experiencing future events as predicted by dispensationalists. The book and its 15 sequels sold 80 million copies. It has also produced four movie series and even a video game. So this is a uh, if you're curious about what dispensationalists view, if you want to see the whole movie, you could probably uh, rent it, download it. It's still uh, it's still around. And if you are not uh, not a dispensationalist if you're orthodox it's a very good depiction the entire series is a fictionalized de depiction of what uh awaits us according to dispensationalist theology now here is a, a summary of the future events according to dispensationalists uh, we'll don't you don't have to memorize these we'll go through them one by one in much greater detail but this is sort of a, a table of contents of what dispensationalists believe uh, is in store for us from here uh on into the future the next event will be the rapture We'll talk about that in much greater detail. And then will become the revelation of the Antichrist and the establishment of a one world government under his control. There will be a seven year great tribulation. About uh, halfway through that seven year great tribulation, uh, the Antichrist will make a pact with Israel. And, but then uh, he will, with his help, uh, the state of Israel will rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, right on the Temple Mount, right where it used to be before it was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. But uh, about the same, about halfway through- Why they feel they have to support, amongst other reasons, they have to support the rebuilding of the temple. Okay. The, the tribulation, the Antichrist will betray Israel and will set up an idol and, of himself and by the way, who, in the Holy of Holies. Who they believe will betray Israel, uh, they mention two groups, Muslims and Russians. And then that he'll mention that a little bit. Of the new rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. So this will be the second half of the Great Tribulation, and it will be horrible for the entire planet. There will be worldwide war. There will be disease. There will be famine. There will be natural disasters. And much of the world's population will die in the second half of the seven-year Great Tribulation. During that time, of the, especially the second half of the Great Tribulation, Jews and Gentiles uh, who believe in Christ will face, as, uh, Gentiles who believe in Christ will face intense persecution. At some point, Russia, uh, uh, Israel will be invaded. Most dispensationalists believe that the invaders will be Russia and China. And they're all gathered together uh, to fight each other. Uh, but at the last moment, uh, just before it looks like the world will come to an end in a nuclear holocaust, Christ returns. He will descend on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Then the, when that happens, the combined military forces of the Antichrist, which will include also will include Russia and China, they will military attempt to ta attack Christ at uh, Armageddon, uh, uh, Megiddo, the, the Valley of Megiddo, which is a valley in Israel. And at that moment, Christ will destroy all of his enemies. He will raise the dead and he will judge all the survivors of the Great Tribulation, both Jew and Gentile. Then the millennium begins and that will be a thousand years where Christ will rule the earth in a new golden age. It will be very much like the Garden of Eden all over again. All sickness and all pain and death will pretty much be uh, non-existent. At the end of the millennium, one last rebel there will be one last rebellion against Christ. <clears throat> Christ will return one more time. There will be one last judgment, and then eternity begins. So that's that's the schedule of expected events in the future to us, according to dispensationalism. So here's a little chart that I put together. Um, you can see uh, the difference between orthodoxy and dispensationalism. When so we'll leave it up to there. Uh, thank you for um, staying in class this long watching this, but now I want to turn our attention to, uh, let me actually, I found while we were watching this, a place we can go to find like different opinions on the issue. So let me do that right now. Uh, so we'll ask this direct question. And then we're going to look at what Putin is up to and how he fits into all of this. 
Uh, Russians are descendants. So here's a plethora of different answers people are giving. And I think it's interesting to read all of them to get a broad view. Is the Russian Empire a continuation of the Byzantine Empire? So now what we're specifically looking at is that uh, the mentioning of the word room, uh, we know 100% this is completely established, is that there is a spiritual connection between the old Rome, Constantinople, and Russia because it's the same Orthodox Church. That is, there's no doubt about that. So now I'm talking more in terms of as a civilization, not just spiritually, and even you can say to some degree uh, in, at a genetic level. Okay, so let's look at what um, these people, they say. Um, is the Russian Empire a continuation of the Byzantine Empire? The first person says, no, not really. No more than the Holy Roman Empire, which is the, 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 the one in Italy, the Vatican, was a continuation of the Roman Empire, but indeed probably a bit less. In addition to the following, the same religion, okay, meaning as the Byzantines, the Imperial Russia adopted certain bits of Byzantine ritual and symbolism. The double-headed -head, eagle, for example, at various times played up a history of alliances. Uh, however, they spoke a different language. They encompassed little or none of the same territory meaning today Russia is uh, in a uh, far into the Asian uh, part and there was never any formal transfer of authority, which is argued, uh, as you will see. I think the way I'd put this is, is the aspects of Roman Empire were inspired by the Byzantines, okay? But there wasn't a meaningful and he continues. Next person uh, says, after the fall of the Byzantine Empire, Ivan the Great married the niece of the last of the Byzantine Emperor and claimed the Russian Empire was a continuation of the Byzantine Emperor. About a century later, Ivan the Terrible was crowned as the first Tsar, their version of Caesar. So the Russian Empire at least claims to be a continuation of that reign. But besides maybe keeping the Orthodox Church alive, little carries over as they didn't exactly hold the old territories of the Byzantine Empire. And this is the big question. They don't carry the same territories. So guess what? They want to carry the same territories. And they're working towards carrying the same territories. So this is, uh, they want those territories back in the Christian world. And that includes maybe ultimately because their grand Kaaba is in Turkey, that includes them wanting back uh, what Turkey has. Okay. So this is a, this uh, is, uh, does yeah. Russia really want it? Does Putin really want it? So we're going to discuss that. I'm going to show you what is being said, right? We don't know a hundred percent. Okay. But uh, what has to be kept in mind is that, what I said in the beginning, that there are two principles I started off with. So let me just repeat those and before we go further. That number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us the Roman Empire will destroy thee or defeat the Persian Empire. Had nothing to do with the Muslims living in Mecca. But it did in the long term. As Islam would expand in the future, it would have a great impact. It was important that the Roman Empire defeat the Persian Empire because the Persian Empire would create a lot of fitnas within the Muslim world. Today, we look at these powers fighting and the average Muslim says, well, that has nothing to do with us. Well, they're wrong. It has everything to do with you. You just don't see it. You don't see how the Protestants and the Zionists, Christians are supporting Israel, which in our end time prophecies holds a great uh, value. Okay, now. Uh, we're going to come to Putin, okay, is Putin, uh, you know, what his view is. So uh, let's just continue with a few more of these definitions. And see, my job 
as a teacher and as a scholar is to give you uh, information that uh, sometimes I, even I'm not comfortable with, but I have to deal with it. Um, and, and so then we deal with it, uh, you know, when, when, in, when you get, let me explain something to you as, as a scholar, I'm gonna tell you something. Nothing in the world of scholarship is a complete cookie cutter. Do you know what I mean by a cookie cutter? Everything doesn't fit in perfectly, okay? There's always gonna be odds, odd things that whatever ideas you see in the Quran or other places, something, is, one little piece missing here, one little piece missing there, you're not gonna get a cookie cutter, okay? You're gonna have to weigh the evidence weigh the information and then make a judgment call using Quran as your guidance to which way you need to go. That's why the Quran is there to help you measure which, where is there more evidence? Where is there more information? Where is there more truth? Okay. And so you're never going to get like a cookie cutter and things most times are not one plus one is two. Most times, especially in, 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 in hermeneutics, looking at the Quran, looking at the hadith, looking at the events of the world, you're not going to get a cookie cutter answer. You're going to get many different ideas. You're going to see Russia as part of this, and Russia has also done this wrong, and this wrong, and this wrong. The Byzantine Empire that Allah supported against the Persian Empire, they weren't angels. But you're looking at the bigger picture, right? So Allah is telling us, don't look at they're cruel and they're cruel and why is Allah supporting this over that? Look at the bigger picture. Look at how this in, in the, in, you know, in, as the domino of events happen, one event to the next event, how they are interplay with one another to the grand plan that Allah has. Okay, so let's go back and then we'll come to the question that the brother just asked because it's an important question. We're going to look at what Putin uh, is doing and has done. It's definitely not a continuation of the Roman Eastern Roman Empire, but can easily be argued that Russia, Eastern Europe, and the Byzantine all comprise a single civilization. And then after Constantinople fell, its locus of cultural power shifted northwards towards the Dutch of uh, Muscovy. Thus, the Byzantine civilization did not truly die out until roughly 1700s. So thanks to the westernization efforts of Peter the Great thus bringing Russia into the fold of Western civilization. So now you have different pieces of information. Now you need to make a judgment. Uh, they're spiritually connected. That's already established. Uh, the argument given that it is not the Byzantine Empire, what's the argument? The argument is they don't occupy the same land. The argument given that it is a continuation of the old Roman Empire is the marriage of the czars, right? And that they carry the same symbolisms. And civilizationally, there may be an argument for that. So now you have to make a judgment call. But that judgment call becomes easy, easier when you look at the Quran. Okay. When you look at the Quran. And you look at the seerah of the prophet and look at what aspect of Rome was highlighted in the Quran or in the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu So what is that aspect that is highlighted within the Quran about the Roman empire that we could take as from the Quran, the primary, you can say criteria. Is it the location? Is it their religion? Is it their orthodoxy? Which is the primary? The Muslims were uh, in, in, in Mecca and the Quraysh were making fun of the Muslim sea. The Persian empire, empire defeated the Romans and your Quran speaks so favorably of Jesus Christ and so on and so forth. And so now Allah reveals this surah as a response. So when you look at the Asbab al-Nuzul, okay, then you may come to the conclusion, you may come to the conclusion that it is not just the location. The location is, is vaxing and waning because the Quran says when they win, they have more, more territory. When they lose, they have less territory, right? That's what it's saying. 
So say they're going to take over some territory and then they're going to recede from that territory and then they're going to take over that territory again. So territory is not what makes them roam. They're roam despite their place of territory. They're roam despite their place of territory. So then what is being meant by roam? Civilizationally, it is referring to their faith and not their location. Because the Quran didn't say, oh, now they're not in these territories, therefore they're not Romans. So location was not part of the definition of them being Roman. Which, when you ask this question, this is what people are saying. Well, they have the same faith. Yes, it's Orthodox Christianity, but it's not the same location. Okay? So I hope I answered this question. Okay. So now let's go to uh, Putin. Okay? Let's see if, inshallah, I can bring this up. Oh, okay, first I wanted to share this with you. Uh, dispensation promise. Israel's right to land. Okay. So, part of the dispensation is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised Israel what? Land. And therefore, because Allah has promised the Jewish people a land, part of Christian aqidah and part of their theology and part of their politics is that what? You have to, Jews, Jewish people have to occupy this land. It's, this is part of their like dispens dispensationalists. This is a major part of their, their thinking. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so you can read this article. It quotes a Bible. And now the Lord had said unto Abraham, get thee unto thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land that I will stew thee. I will make thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great. And, I, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee. Meaning those people that say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad. Kamal salli ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim. Those people that bless Ibrahim and his progeny, which is what you're doing when you're blessing the Prophet and his progeny, because it's from Ibrahim. And then you're also blessing the progeny of Ibrahim wasalam. So this is saying, since the Jews are the children of Abraham, you have to bless them and help them and support them no matter what they do. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee, meaning the children of Israel. And thee shall all families of earth be blessed, meaning, uh, and thee shall, and you all families, meaning the children of Israel will be blessed. Okay. And, uh, and it goes on talking about this, but the point is how important dispensationalism is so on the one side, you have a theology that's saying you have to support Israel and it's part of our Aqidah and you have to do it. And the other is saying, and that same theology is saying Russia is the enemy, right? So keep all of this in mind that the world, and this is one thing I want, I want to say this, it's very, very important to kind of understand this in terms of events of the world. There's a zahir and there's a batin. There's something on the outside and then something on the inside. On the outside, you see secularism. There's godlessness. Under that, if you want to blame, like I'm giving an example, if you want to blame somebody for the events of the world, you say, okay, it's the, it's the, it's the, um, it's America. Okay. And then you go deeper and you say, well, it's democracy. And you go deeper and you say, it's liberalism. And you go deeper and you find these layers, right? Of what is the problem? On the bottom of these layers, on the bottom of these layers is faith. Okay. And faith is driving what? Faith is driving the direction of people's thinking. But the difference between Muslim religious people and, and, and other, especially Christians and especially the Protestant Christian, the Zionist Christians, is that when I become religious, I have a beard, I have a topi, I have this, I have that, you tell, oh, this is a religious person. But when a Christian becomes religious, he's still wearing a suit and tie. You don't know who's becoming religious, who has religious ideas, 
because they're a religious person, a religious Christian, and a non-religious Christian is wearing the same clothes. But what people don't know is, you know, people talk about, and I, this is not the subject, so I'm not going to talk about this today, but I'm just going to mention it, that people talk about the rise of Islamic fundamentalism, the rise of Islamic fundamentalism, the rise of Islamic fundamentalism. It's the rise of fundamentalisms of all sides. There is, this is sociologically what's happening in the world. I don't have time right now to go in to show you the, um, the, the sightings, but Hindu fundamentalism, you see what's happening in India? Hindu, Hindutva, what's happening? Hindu fundamentalism is on the rise. Jewish fundamentalism is on the rise. Christian fundamentalism with Putin especially is on the rise. Uh, Christian fundamentalism with all these satanic people like John Hagee is on the rise. So, Religion is on the rise. And this is happening as nation states are beginning to crumble. Okay. And so what is the point of saying that, that religion is on the rise? Meaning that people are more and more influenced in their thinking by what their religion is teaching them. And they're trying to, as one famous book puts it, they're trying to force God's hands. Now, let me show this book to you because this is worth Look, this book is worth looking at. Um, and this is the Christianity that the Jews are supporting, okay? And so people like John Hagee get a special seat in Israel, okay? Because they're saying, Israel is great, Israel is great. And they're like, oh, this Christianity, we love this. Let's support this. Let's put money into this. Let's make this man a millionaire. Make sure he's on TV. Forcing God's hands, why millions pray for a quick rapture and the destruction of the planet Earth, okay? The book explores the danger of posed Christian fundamentalism, a doctrine that is sweeping America. Leaders of the doctrine proclaim God wants, even demands the planet to be destroyed. In our generation, adherents to this doctrine are said to constitute the fastest growing movement in Christianity today. Fundamentalist evangelicals believe there will be a catastrophe that word, events on earth, some occurring ar uh, already, including turmoil in the Middle East, culminating in the Battle of the Ar Armageddon, in which Christ will triumph and be ruling the earth. At this point, they believe non-believers will be destroyed, good Christians saved, and any remaining Jews converted to Christianity. By praying for the rapture and the end time, might they, might they force the hand of God, meaning they're going to force the events, they're going to manufacture the events so that the end times come. This book also includes a CBS 60 minute program, Zionist Christian Soldiers, an interview with Jerry Farewell. Grace, uh, ha, ha, uh, this person served President Lyndon Johnson as a speechwriter for three years. She covered both Korea and Vietnam as a journalist and wrote for newspapers, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, so this, uh, this book is a very good book in trying to understand what's happening in the world in terms of forcing God's hands. Who are the people that are forcing God's hands? It's the Protestant Christianity. It's the, it's the evangelicals. It's the Zionist Christians. And for them, Israel is a centerpiece of making God happy. And part of it is to make the children of Israel happy. Now, let's continue, inshallah, here. Uh, so the third temple period, okay, distinctive dispensationalism, tell the times, okay? And this is all about, okay, uh, this is all about uh, the, the, why Christians need to support the building of the third temple, why Christians need to support the Jews going back to Israel, okay? Why the Christians need to support the state of Israel. Okay, again, I can't emphasize this more than enough. If Allah allows me, I'll just uh, do this very quickly. And then uh, we'll, inshallah, continue from there to the next point. And then, inshallah, uh, not too much more remaining. And then we'll wrap it up, inshallah. Uh, John uh, Hagee, Israel, and America.
So let me ask, let me ask the audience, how is it that we are taking the word of Hamas? How is it that we are taking the words here of our enemies and we are using them to point to Israel? Why, why? does anybody? So let me ask let me ask the audience how is it that we are taking the word of hamas how is this guy is a mormon by the way and the the guy who's asking the question here is a mormon and then john hagee is going to answer he's the big pastor he's the mufti azam of america he's the mufti azam of the Grish, christian zionists okay he's the big mufti he's the usama bin laden terrorist mentality christian who wants war is it that we are taking the words here of our enemies and we are using them to point to Israel? Why, why? Does anybody here have an answer on, Pastor, maybe you have an answer. Why are the American people buying into this? The American people are buying into this because they do not recognize Israel's relationship to history, to the Word of God, and to what they mean to America as a democracy. America should notice here, Christians United for Israel. Okay. You can't imagine the type of uh, barbaric uh, mindset these people have. They wear suit and ties and look good and everything, but just watch. Stand by Israel because Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. Israel has been America's friend who votes with us more in the UN than any other nation. Israel also has a very unique relationship with a superpower that a secular society in America does not recognize, and that would be God Almighty. God has created Israel. God has said, I am the defender of Israel, for he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. God has said through the prophet Joel that any nation, that would include America, who tries to divide the land of Israel or the city of Jerusalem will be brought to judgment. Therefore, it's very clear to say that the day America turns its back on Israel, God do will you, turn its back on America. Do you think that, that, um, that it would matter that the American people haven't? Because I don't think the American people, we, we're watching this on the news. We're watching, and we all know, and we're, we're thinking, did September 11th not happen? When we see the Fogel family brutally murdered, and then you have the same people out giving out candy in the streets and cake exactly the way they did on 9-11, do we not remember? This is exactly, these are the same people. So does it matter that, the, that it is the administration that is lying their way into this situation? Or, or, or I, 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 no, they are lying their way into it. They're, this is a covert op. This, this is a situation where from Morocco to Turkey, simultaneously you see these nations in revolt, all moving in the same direction. I believe that Iran, through the Islamic Brotherhood, is orchestrating all of this for the Dor purpose of attacking Israel. Okay, so on the one side, you got this. You got a Christianity that is on the side of Israel. You had a Christianity that sees Muslims as the Antichrist. It sees Russia as the Antichrist. You have a world that's becoming more religious. You have a world that is also becoming more into witchcraft. That's a whole different uh, discussion. So does it matter? Okay, so now let me go to Putin, please. And, and I'll end after I discuss Putin and then make my final remarks. Uh, inshallah, uh, if I don't have it here. Uh, yeah, let me see if it's here. Okay, Moscow, the third Rome or the new Israel. Okay, uh, recent events in the former uh, Soviet Union have stimulated the rethinking of many uh, previously ex exomotic notions about the past and present of Russia. But the, the point here is, is that what does 
Russia want? Russia wants another Rome. They want another Byzantine Empire. They want to bring under their authority all of the Orthodox Christianity. That's what they want. So Muslims have to be aware of that and they have to be able to navigate that and deal with that. Okay, that's what he wants to do. Um, let me show you. Uh, Third Rome, a very brief history of Russia and Ukraine. Again, this is all about, from a religious point of view, about bringing uh, the religious, uh, because the, the Ukraine's uh, religiousness goes back to Russia, meaning Russians appoint their, uh, their priests. Um, until recently, uh, that was happening. So Moscow decided who is the priests in Ukraine. Okay. Now it's gone to a point where they want that third Rome. They want to, so they, they see themselves as Rome. Okay. That's what they claim about themselves. Why do Russians call Moscow the third Rome? Okay. So uh, successor to Rome and Constantinople. It was the Orthodox monk. Okay. Who called Moscow the third Rome for the first time. Okay. And then all Christian kingdoms have come to an end and have converged in the single kingdom of our sovereign. Two Romes fell, a third stands, and there will not be a fourth one. Okay. Forgotten idea. Okay. Third Rome, again, this idea of third Rome. Okay. And now let me see if I can bring to you some information about uh, how Putin fits into uh, the third Rome. Let's see if I can do that. I thought I had something up here, but uh, Putin in the third Rome. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, uh, let's see what the importance of the Byzantine Empire is not missed by Rome. It has, however, been suppressed within Western history education. It has been suppressed because it looks to caste and here in the West, we, uh, it, it has been suppressed because it looks to the East and here in the West, we do not. Why, what was Byzantine? In a nutshell, Byzantine was Rome. More specifically, Byzantine was the Rome that existed after Constantine turned the Roman world from its pagan roots towards Christianity and after the city of Rome ceased to be the capital of the Roman Empire in 330 AD. Byzantine was an ancient Greek city that was rebuilt from its very foundations and became the imperial uh, capital under Constantine. Okay, and then it goes on. Moscow as the third room. So why do Russian athletes wear Byzantine eagles on their chests of their uniforms? Simply put, Moscow wants to be the third Rome. When Constant Constantinople was conquered after two centuries as Rome, capital of the Ottoman Turks under the leadership of Muhammad, uh, 1432, Russia had become a central part of the Byzantine alliance. The Russian czar, a derivative of Latin Caesar or imperial ruler, assumed and presumed the role of the imperial head of the Roman Empire. Following the Bolshevik Revolution, the establishment of the Communist Secular United uh, Soviet Socialist Republic in 1922, this imperial legacy was largely log lost, reclaiming the legacy. Okay. In recent history, historians are reclaiming this Byzantine history and its Russian legacy under Vladimir Putin. Russia's history has been largely Byzantine. Putin has associated Russia with Byzantine in ways that are apparent to countries with an orthodox legacy, but not necessarily clear to the rest of the world. Byzantine matters. It matters if we want to associate Russia today with Imperial Russia at its zenith. If you decide, if you recognize the double-headed eagle of Byzantine Russian uniforms over the last decade make a lot of sense. If you do not, it is not important to ask why this symbol does not have as much uh, uh, renaissance as the hammer and the sickle or the maple leaf have. Russia is reclaiming the legacy of the Byzantine, Rome, and of antiquity, Orthodox Christianity. This is not a threat, but this is why Byzantine matters. Okay, so this is not a threat, but this is why it matters. Now, if Turkey sides with NATO, 
if Turkey sides with NATO and sides with the Zionists and sides with uh, the wrong side and then continues its Ottoman legacy of hurting the Christians uh, in the, uh, the, the Greek Orthodox Church, okay? Uh, and so uh, that, that would create a problem for Muslims. That would definitely create a problem for Muslims. Uh, is it NATO that's going to take over Turkey? Or is it going to be Russia that's going to take over Turkey? I think, I think it is going to be the events that will come. It will be NATO that is going to take over Turkey, I think. But Allah knows best. I don't know. Maybe Russia will take over first and then NATO will take over after. But things are moving in a direction that things are going to happen. And I don't have time to go into today's and now what's happening now with Russia after, uh, after these last few days. But uh, uh, Israel has clearly now sided with NATO and uh, uh, Russia and uh, Germany and other countries are sending uh, more military weapons. And uh, this is, uh, there. Russia is, is going to feel cornered uh, and they're going to fight uh, hard. They're gonna fight hard. And so Allah knows best. But what I wanted to share with you, I don't have an answer as far as what will happen with Turkey and which side, okay? But I do have a, a do, do see that two, three things need to be clear. Why should Muslims care about what's happening in uh, Russia and Ukraine? We should care because number one, NATO, America, and the Zionist Christians, they want control, they want to be able to put, uh, keep Russia down as part of their religious framework, okay? Number one. Number two, their religious framework is to side with Israel. So the more Russia has encroached on the NATO, the, then the less power they have, more power we will have, or others will have, you know, however you look at it. Meaning I'm looking at the long-term events. I'm not talking about today. I'm talking about 20 years, 30 years, when the Mahdi will be here, when the nation states will fall, when like the Quran is talking about the Roman empire, they weren't angels, but they're defeating the bigger, bigger threat to Islam, helped Islam grow. And so it's, you have to look at it from that perspective, that which of the two are more evil. Now, uh, uh, let me now go to this other verse, okay? Now that uh, this is one of the things that actually I wanted to share with you that's very important in this discussion, and then we'll end, inshallah. I'll leave it for all of you to ask any questions that you may have. I'll take a few um, but again, now when we come to this point, uh, now in the context of When Allah says, Lan ankal yahudu wa lan nasara, the Christians, now Allah is telling us in the context of this spiritual alliances, Zionist Christians who believe Israel is a critical part of end times uh, framework, Allah is saying, Lan ankal yahudu wa lan nasara. The Jews and Christians will not. Be, this is the Judeo-Christian civilization. This is where, what is it that brings Judeo and Christians together? It is the idea of dispensationalism. It's the theology of dispensationalism. It is the idea that America is no good if it is not helping Israel. It is the religious idea that Christians are obligated to help Jews on earth in order to have salvation in the church. Okay, so... On the one side, you have a force that Allah is saying that they will never be happy with you. And they are, will never be happy with you because they, they stand for something that is in short term, long term, and always going to be against, uh, is, is going to turn out to be against you. 
So lan tarda anka al-yahud wa lan nasara hatta tattabi'a millatahum qul inna huda Allahi huwa al-huda wa la in i'tabata ahwa'ahum if you follow their desires if you follow their way if you follow the people of Christian Zionism if you follow the people who follow the creative dispensationalism who everything in the beginning and end everything of everything is help Israel okay if you follow their desires after knowledge has come to you Allah is telling you so whether we say there are two issues here whether we say we should side with Russia or not that's a secondary issue the part where Allah is saying you cannot form an alliance do not form an alliance with people that believe in dispensationalism so the when you look at it from the macro perspective it is telling Pakistan and Afghanistan and Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and Turkey and all the Muslim countries and Dubai that don't put your eggs in that basket okay that's the first point don't put your eggs in that basket because Allah said no and if you don't get it Allah gets it right now number one so then the question is okay but we live in a world where we have to have alliance obviously Muslim countries can have alliances with one another but is there something else Allah tells us of where your alliances should be and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points to a people that you can have an alliance with them just as you can marry them. You cannot marry, meaning, you know, one sister got married and she's like, okay, if you got married to a Muslim brother and you're, you're a good Muslim, alhamdulillah, it's done. That was written for you. But you cannot marry a girl who's not church going, doesn't listen to a priest, doesn't have an understanding of the Bible. It's just as you cannot do that, you cannot fall into an alliance with people that are following, uh, that that have a sub, that have changed their deen completely. It's no longer, yeah. يعني, it's interesting. Allah doesn't call them Ahlul Kitab at this point in the Quran. Okay, Allah calls them Jews and Christians, and Jews and Christians, the Judeo. And I'm going to do a separate video, uh, maybe in a few days, on what is the Judeo-Christian civilization. But from a religious perspective, the coming together of the Judeo-Christian civilization via the Schofield Bible, via the idea of dispensationalism, and via their love and love and love for Israel, puts us at complete odds. Okay, complete odds. What will, what will we do when we put all our baskets with America and NATO and Europe and as people become more religious? And then Israel says, we need to establish a greater Israel. What are you going to do then? You're not going to have, you're going to be in the wrong side of the history. You're going to be in the side that's going to be hurting the Muslims. So it's just, you know, because people say, well, what about this? Russia has this wrong and this wrong and this wrong and this wrong. Yes, Russia has all those things wrong. Russia is part of the fourth industrial revolution. It's part of this and part, all of that's given. But the direction in Quran is not here for sure. And if you were, you will find these people to be closer to you. So you have a better chance with an alliance with them. Not because, you know, Allah doesn't say the Byzantine Empire is going to beat the, uh, the, the, the Persians because they're angels. It's not uh, Putin is a hero. But he's putting a stop to the new world order. He's becoming a barrier for that design where Israel flourishes and becomes a world power. Okay, and so, uh, yeah, so Putin wants to unite the Orthodox Christians. And do we have a problem with Christians wanting to become more Christians? As Muslims, do we have a problem with that? We don't have a problem with that. Do we have a problem with having an alliance with anyone? Didn't the Prophet make an alliance with Quraysh? Didn't he make alliances with the Jews? Didn't he make alliances with the Christians? Yes. But Allah is talking, but when you see Jews and Christians become one force, then don't make an alliance with them. But then the question is, we live in the global world. We need alliances. Who can we make an alliance with? Well, Allah is saying there's some Christians. Some of them may be in Palestine. Some of them may be in Africa. Some of them may be part of the Orthodox Christian Church. Allah is specifically pointing to the Romans those who carry that legacy, that spiritual legacy, as 
the ones that Allah has favored over the others. So you have to look at the larger context. It's not that Putin is an angel, no. But Putin is of a, he is on the side of traditional values. He's against gays and lesbians. He is uh, against, uh, you know, the, the, this kind of like gender, uh, gender, uh, this, this whole thing that's ha happening with the gay and lesbian and all the other, he's for marriage. He's for all those things. Whereas the other side of Christianity, this dispensationalism, it, that their deen has become so much Israel, 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 that they've let everything else go. All other values go. All other traditional values go. Okay. And so uh, I'll just end with this um, as, as part of my trying to explain. And then I'll open up for maybe a few questions. But if you look at, you know, uh, again, for me, uh, one of the key things to tell how things are going, okay, uh, why do Orthodox Christian women wear veils, veiled Christian women? The only, you know, here, let me show you this, uh, and then I'll make this point. One of the few women in the world that is a wife of a leader that does hijab is Putin's wife, okay? She doesn't do it all the time, but she does it a lot, especially when she's in the church, which is one of the only times you really see her. She does more hijab than most Muslim women who are the wives of Muslim men, meaning the, the, in the leadership, like you take- sure, uh, I think so, uh, they both got divorced. <laughs> oh, they did, okay, that's fine. Yeah. But yeah. it doesn't take away from the fact that what that that the Christian women they have head coverings, right? And that modesty is part of their deen. And what NATO and what evangelical Christian Christianity represents is the complete opposite of that. It's 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 not a uh, So, you know, their men's have beards, their women, they have scarves, they care about modesty. Those values are, are dear to us and they uphold them. And the civilization, the Judeo-Christian civilization that doesn't uphold these values are a threat to us. I'm not talking about just in terms of power, but in terms of social engineering. If they wear hijab, they're not going to threaten our women that wear hijab, right? If they care for modesty, they're not going to threaten our modesty. They're going to respect our modesty. But the other side that only cares for Israel and the rise of Israel, and that's their whole, the centerpiece of dispensationalism, when you look at it from an applied perspective, that's... the. They're, they're completely have gone bonkers, completely an antithesis to with almost nothing in common with the Islamic lifestyle. Okay. Uh, yes, Sister Fatima. You know, people are going to say like these exceptional things, like you're going to compare the Queen of England still covers her head to the rest of the entire society that's into pornography and, and immodesty. Like you're talking about a society that is trying to establish a society based upon modesty versus another society, the Muslims establishing a society based upon modesty. You can't compare that with one individual who does it as part of their tradition. I mean, it's just not a fair analysis. Uh, yeah, but that the, does the queen say I'm wearing a hijab, everybody else wear a hijab? She doesn't say that. She doesn't promote that. And she doesn't care about that. For her, it's just a ritual. It has nothing to do with their spirituality. Uh, yes, Sister Fatima. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Um, my question was, um, I agree with everything you're saying. Uh, one 
uh, doubt that comes to my mind is, uh, you know, Russia with the mandates. You know, I felt like this was a litmus test, you know, with what's going on for the last two years. People, countries, There's no nations. mandate in Russia, as far as I know. Uh, also, so they're, uh, the, they're promoting the a vaccine. Injection, no, no, there, there's no uh, mandates in Russia, as far as I know. Uh, there is also the the Sp Sputnik vaccine is not mRNA vaccine. That is also another thing. That this is Sasti, bro. Come on. Yeah. So I mean, I don't know the specifics about the, you know, if it's an mRNA vaccine or whatnot, but it it does seem to be, like that's why I'm asking this question because I'm not sure if they're just trying to play the game. No, or, that's a very, you know, very good, very good question and a very good criteria, right? It's a very good criteria. So I feel and I could be wrong so here's an, here's like what I feel now if somebody has more information that's fine so there are those nations that went with the script like pushing it pushing it Germany England the United States Canada Australia forcing it on their people forcing it on their people following the same script and then you have countries that went along with it right because there could be many reasons why they went along with it one of the reasons could be that they bought into the script well if I mean who expects there to be a global conspiracy. So they went along with it. They created a vaccine, but they never made it. Uh, people in, in, you can see the articles in this. And in fact, one of my last lectures, I think I even showed this. Most Russians don't care about the pandemic for the most part. They don't, it is, it is nothing to do with their daily lives, right? So they did make the vaccine for the people that want it. And it's, it's the traditional type of vaccine, which is still problematic, of course, but it's not the, uh, this new technology that goes into your body and then teaches your body to make the spike protein and then has no end button to it and then teaches your body to fight the, uh, fight, um, the, the, the mRNA uh, technology. It's the, it's the traditional one, the one like Johnson & Johnson made. But your question is correct, meaning the principle of your question is correct, which is, if Israel, if Russia, right, which is the country that went with the script all out, all out to the end was Israel, okay? They went with the script all, they're on their fourth booster, okay? And so if Russia went with the script the way Israel and America and England as a criteria, if, if Russia did that, then that would be a question mark, okay? Uh, my understanding is they didn't, okay? And if you look at most Russian pictures of Putin, for example, he's never in a face mask, okay? Uh, if you look at most of the, uh, the army, even right now, the, the, they're not wearing... But Ukraine was imposing the, va the, the masks and, 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 the, and the, uh, the vaccine much more aggressively than Russia was. And in fact, I don't know if people know this, but who had said, the World Health Organization had said not to do any autopsies of the people that have COVID because they don't want the surgeons to get COVID. Anybody remember this? Do you know the country that did the autopsies of the people that had COVID to study it? It was Russia. Do you know what the result of that study was? That this is not, what? This is not what, this is not an infectious disease. This is not just respiratory disease. This is something far more sinister. And they were describing in their studies, this was a published study. Uh, if somebody can find it and knows about it, then they can put it in the chat room. They described that it has created like kind of like fibers in the lungs of the people that got that, the disease to that point that it, it doesn't fit the definition of an infectious disease. Number one. Number two, one of the things that's happening in this war between Ukraine and the United uh, uh, Ukraine and Russia is that Ukraine had many, and in my um, my channel I put that link up there. That Ukraine had a contract with the United States to have several of these uh, labs that were studying viruses. Okay, uh, five of them. Okay. Um, Bioweapons, yes. So they had several of these labs. One of the tasks that they're doing is to destroy each one of those American labs. Okay, to destroy each of those labs that 
uh, is doing these bioweapons. Now, again, it's, this is why I keep trying to emphasize this point. You're not going to find uh, you're not going to find an angel. You're not going to find the Mahdi. You're not going to find Isa. You're not going to find uh, that. But you're going to find two different ideologies, one that is far more vicious to Islam than the other one. Okay, One ideology, as bad as its adherents are or not are, or they're with partially a part of the agenda or not partially part of the agenda, one group of people have something better to offer us than people that are literally from a theological perspective looking for our destruction via the greater Israel, which is where this all ends up. The third temple for the Jews, because Christians say you have to build a third temple to bring back Jesus. Obviously, and, and you know, I'll do a separate video on eschatology and Judaism and, and so that you can kind of like compare. For the Jews, the coming, the third temple is important, not for the coming of Jesus, that's what the Christians say. But for the Jews, the third temple is important for coming for the Messiah. And when their Messiah comes, they'll follow their Messiah. And the Messiah is going to do what? He's going to establish the greater Israel. Where is this greater Israel? It's in the Muslim lands. So this is the long term, like 10 year, you know, 10 year, you can say uh, 10 year, 20 year, 30 year out, outlook of what could happen if NATO succeeds and if America succeeds. And as people come into more desperate times and in desperate times become people what become more religious. And as people become more religious, they're going to be fed this uh, nonsense, and they're going to support Israel in the in the idea that okay, we're in terrible world right now. Let's try to get Jesus to come here as quickly as possible. Let's help Israel do what it wants to do, and then you know we will be happy ever after. After that, it's never going to happen. But this is what uh, this is one side, the satanic side, the ones that Allah said very simply, Judeo Christian, no, that's not an alliance. Muslim countries should be doing. Whether you agree with Russia that, that they fit that verse, and also about that one verse, I'll share with you something. Um, or no, I'll leave it this time. Maybe next time I'll talk about it. But yeah, so I think I said enough for now, inshallah. Um, uh, let me see what is being said. Uh, Russia and allies would be long-term beneficial to Muslims, but still think somehow Orthodox is uh, target is also Constantinople, and I do not blame that either. Well, yes, of course, because Hagia Sophia should have been there right from the very beginning, right? And uh, but all that will depend upon what uh, it will depend upon how well M Muslims and uh, are in receiving the Orthodox Christians. If they've been fighting them, if they've been raising arms against them, then you give them every right to take over their former territory. But if you have an alliance with them, if you put your alliance where Allah is telling you to put your alliance, right, then you have a better chance of negotiating something that, okay, we'll open Hagia Sophia for you. We'll make it a Christian site. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll help you unite. We will, in fact, help you unite your Orthodox Christianity, and you help us unite all the Muslims, right? Help us to reestablish the Khilafah. If you have that attitude versus, oh, we better side with NATO, we better side with the European Union, you're shooting yourself on the foot in terms of who Allah is telling you to side with. Because even if Russia looks like it's going to lose, they may win in the end, and you're going to be in trouble when they do. And number two, when the people you're siding with, they're going to come back around the other way and backstab you anyway. Okay? Via Israel and their aqidah, their belief system of dispensationalism. So this, I wanted it to be clear of how the end time eschatologies are different. Orthodox Christians also want Jesus to come back. And that's all it is. It's very, very simple. We want Jesus to come back. We're waiting for him to come back. That's all. That's their end times. For the other group, it's like we have to support Israel. There is a there is a worldly responsibility to support with Israel 
and then support the church for your salvation in the hereafter. And we'll be all lifted up. Those that of us that are saints will be lifted into the heavens and will never come back to earth. And then Jesus will come to the earth and rule the earth forever. As nonsensical as that sounds, that's what they believe. And all their eggs, all their effort, all their energy, wallahi, 90% of their money and energy, everything goes to what? Helping and supporting the state of Israel. You know, and, 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 and most of the work that is being done to return Jews to Israel, right? Telling Jews, go back to Israel, go back to Israel, is being done by Christians. Okay, any other questions? I'll take one or two last questions and then call it a day, inshallah. Sheikh, I had an uh, unrelated question, actually. Okay. So it was about uh, about uh, about uh, Prophet Uzair in Quran, uh, the uh, Jews believing him as a, a son of God, but uh, no Jews actually believe that, uh, at least they don't claim uh, uh, about it. So uh, I have never found a video, any Muslim scholars uh, explaining about it. So um, can you tell uh, something about it? There was a group of, group of Jews in Yemen who, who believed Uzair was a son of God. Now, this has to be also understood in its larger... That was, uh, in, uh, they were asking then, uh, why is, is it in Quran? If that was so important. Uh, also, there's a, a video in the Believer channel that uh, says, uh, the, uh, it's not Uzair, but the... Uh, the uh, Egyptian god uh, Osiris was the uh, actual actual Osiris in Quran. Uh, do you know about it? No, I would be interested in that. But let me start this from the universal principles and then come down to the specific statement. Number one, Jews do believe in the sons of God. They call themselves the children of God. Okay, the Quran mentions a statement from their mouths: "Nahnu abna Allah." We are the children of Allah. And Allah loves us because we're his children. And then Allah says, why, Then why is Allah punishing you? If you're the, his son, if you're really his sons, his chosen ones, then why is Allah punishing you? Number one. Number two, so the concept, children of God, sons of God, favors of God, favorites of God, this is there is in their theology. Chosen people of God, this is there. Number two, why Uzair? Because when the Jews were downtrodden and they were taken to Babylonia and they were uh, captives uh, of the Babylonians, who led the movement to their second rise? When they got freed, they came back to Jerusalem, Cyrus the Great, uh, according to me, Zulqarnain, let them go. But either way, everybody agrees, Cyrus the Great lets them go. They come to Jerusalem. Jerusalem flourishes. And then the prophet of Allah, who brings back the Maccabi power, the great Maccabi power, the Jewish power. So, you know, first rise was under Suleiman, and Daud and Suleiman. So this was the first rise. Then they had a slight, they had like a, a over the centuries, there was a, uh, a degradation. And then the second rise, happens under the hands of Uzair And in fact, there are biblical references about the coming back of Uzair It is also possible from an eschatological perspective that when Jesus comes back or the Antichrist comes, many of them will say this was Uzair who has come back. Because this is mentioned in the Bible that Uzair will come back. Okay. So it may be an event or a statement that they say in the future. Allahu alam. I don't, can't say this for sure. But in terms of historically people that actually took him as a son of God. Uh, first, keep in mind in the Bible, there's sons everywhere. Adam is the son of God. David is the son. Of, I've begotten thee. You're my firstborn. Okay. Abraham is the son of God. Okay, so like this, there are many sons of God. But 
in the context of the ayah, it is referring to doing shirk, meaning making someone a creation of Allah equal to Allah. So there was a group of Yemenites, Yemeni Jews, who used to believe because of this rise of power that happened under the hands of Uzair wasalam, that they used to believe Uzair wasalam, was the son of God. Meaning he was, uh, now this is a longer conversation, but uh, a type of Messiah, but a, a Messiah that has uh, divine attributes. So let me just see if I can show this to you very quickly. Uh, Uzair, son of God or Allah in Quran. Let's see if I can find a reference to uh, Jews in Yemen. If I can show you this. So let's see what this place says. Uh, It will become clear that the Quran assertion that the Jews consider Uzair to be the son of God is not an isolated claim, but one, a number, a number made concerning uh, the Jews of Medina. Wherever a juristic and theological significance, this is, accusation has to, came to have, it was the result of Muslim Jewish interaction and gradual crystallization of Islamic lay theology and popular pop, pi, uh, piety in its tales and legends. In reconstructing the personality of Uzair, several genres of literature were, shall be used. So basically, uh, the children of Israel, Jews in Quran. So let me see if I can find something more quickly than going through this. Uh, Okay, let's see what John, Jonathan Brown says. The Quran, Jews, and Uzair, son of God. Uh, why does the Quran tell us that Jews claim Uzair is the son of God when Jews do not make this claim anything or approaching it? This is not a question that arose just recently during the interfaith panel. Okay, so uh, an explanation given by Muslim scholars from the time of Tabari is that this belief had in fact been held by a group of Jews in Arabia and this sect had died out. Ibn Hazm, the famous Andalusian scholar wrote that there was a group of Jews in Yemen who believed in this. Interestingly, an inscription from the fourth and sixth century Jewish temple in so South Arabia suggests possible angel worship. A second explanation was that the Quran, Quran the Quranic verse related to the verse immediately following it uh, they have taken their rabbis and monks as lords apart from God. In other words, Jews venerated Azra so much that it was as if he were a god to them. Muslim scholars found a basis for their first claim that some Jews actually considered Uzair to be the son of God in a Jewish work entitled The Fourth Book of Azra. Okay, so this is a very famous book of the, um, of the Jews. Uh, probably comprised of the first century, which had not been included in Hebrew Bible, but which rabbis still read and consulted. It belonged to a body of works known as the Old Testament, uh, such and such, namely works that claimed to be written by some Old Testament figures, such as Enoch, but which were really produced in the Hellenistic or early Roman periods. Fourth, Ezra tells us Ezra led the children of Israel after their return from Babylon exile when their scriptures had been lost. This is all in the Bible's book of Ezra as well. Ezra is given inscription by God to reconstitute the Torah in four, uh, 451. As a reward, God tells Ezra that you shall be taken up from among men and henceforth you shall live with my son. It is important to remember that like the belief of the Quraysh, the angels were daughters of God, we worship angels, who are daughters of God, it's, this is mentioned in the Quran, said the Quraysh to the Prophet 
uh, Ibn Ishaq, uh, this, uh, in Ibn Ishaq Sirah, it mentions this. The Jewish scriptures of this period, angels were called the children of God. But there does not seem to be any strong evidence that Jews of Western Arabia at the time of the Prophet believed this about Azra. The problem is that we do not have any external sources, in other words, non-Muslim sources, for what Jews in Arabia believed. Peter's observed the Quran is pretty much the only source for we, what we have for what Jews believed in 7th century Arabia. Another possibility is that Uzair is mentioned in the Quran was never a for a for one for one counterpart of Azra, uh, meaning uh, the first part of the Quran does not actually specify the Jews believed in Azra was the son of God. It says that they said Uzair was the son of God. The Quran provides no more information about Uzair nor do the main stay hadith collections. The hadith in Sahih Bukhari re reiterates the claim made in the Quran and the hadith of Abu Daud quotes the Prophet as saying he does not know if Uzair is a prophet or not. Um, what other information we find is less critical is less is critical uh, is in less critical collections of hadith comes from stor stories drawn from figures like uh, you know uh, so it goes on. What's the end result of this is that uh, the end result is that uh, maybe as the Tabari, Imam Tabari says that some Jews in uh, Yemen said this and uh, or some Jews in Arabia, they said this. Allahu Akbar. But I think this might have an eschatological uh, uh, relevance, but I haven't dug on it that much yet. All right, I'll take one last question and then I think we've had enough for today, inshallah. Sheikh, uh, one question. Could that conflict be the beginning of Al Malhama? Malhama will take place after the great rise of Israel and the fall of Medina. And it will take place uh, after that. So we're not there. Will all this lead to that? That's possible. That's possible. But is this the big a series of events that leads to something bigger and bigger? And then, uh, yes, that is very possible. And Allah knows best. But as of now, uh, there's no reason to say that yet but Allah knows best now, will, do I believe this conflict will get bigger um, if in fact Russia is a true opponent of new world order then I believe this conflict will get bigger and it will get tougher and bigger and the war may drag out uh, longer than expected but I don't know maybe Allah will give them because it's about it's you know we don't know what Allah intends Maybe Allah gives them a quick victory. And uh, if they are, uh, but, but what I do know is that they will try to, um, they will try their best to not let Ukraine go into the hands of Russia and bring Russia right at the door of the rest of the Orthodox Christianity and uh, bring uh, the rest of uh, Russia right at the door of Europe and uh, it will give uh, Russia a very big advantage, strategically. Okay, inshallah. I hope this was useful uh, in terms of end time discussion within the two parts of Christianity. I hope it made it clear. Uh, and then looking at the verses of the Quran from that perspective. And then also the general question of you know, why should we side with Israel, uh, with the, uh, Russia when they do bad things also? So I tried to clarify that through Sutrum. And the other thing I tried to clarify is the Quranic definition of the word room uh, and uh, whether it is land related or it's spiritually related. Uh, and so I tried to clarify that. And, uh, and so here we are. I hope you all found it beneficial and adding to your dimensions of thinking about the world and what's happening and how um, we, we live in a world where everything is interconnected. It's not as simple as saying, 
oh, that's NATO and that's Russia, let them fight it out and it doesn't matter to us. That is a very naive uh, position to take. Okay. I mean, uh, yeah. So, inshallah ta'ala, jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Okay, I will check that video, inshallah. All right, assalamu alaikum, guys. Let me get this video my brother sent. We are running out of time to convert the church into a masjid. Right now, your brothers and sisters.